Okay, everyone, I just want to take a minute to get started here. Um, I want to welcome students, practitioners, professors, activists, and community members. We are happy to welcome you all to the UCLA Law Review's 2021 Symposium, Structural Inequality in the Law. My name is Ryan Garcia, and I am the UCLA Law Review Symposium Editor, as well as the co-president of the Native American Law Students Association here at UCLA Law. I'd like to open this program with a land acknowledgement. The UCLA Law Review acknowledges the Gabrieleno and Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the indigenous peoples in this place. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to ancestors, elders, and our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to thank the UCLA American Indian Studies Center for continuing their commitment and leading the way in this work. Again, to address a few formatting details, we will have two American Sign Language interpreters rotating during the sessions, and they will appear automatically alongside the speakers. During the webinar for closed captions, please click the CC icon at the bottom of the Zoom bar. I would now like to take a moment to recognize and thank our co-sponsors for providing the support necessary to make this event possible. Thank you to Skadden LLP, who is joined by the African American Policy Forum, the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy, the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA Law, the UCLA Law Criminal Justice Program, the UCLA Law Critical Race Studies Program, the UCLA Law Veterans Legal Clinic. Thank you. I would also like to thank the moderators, panelists, and UCLA Law Review members who worked tirelessly to put the symposium together, as well as everyone whose work and resistance has contributed to these conversations. Finally, I want to personally extend my deepest gratitude to our UCLA Law Review Editor-in-Chief, A.K. Shi. Thank you for bringing the values of our journal to life through your leadership. Here's A.K. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. There are so many of you with us in the audience, ranging from law students, other grad students, professors and practitioners, to activists, supporters, and other friends who share our commitment to learning about and scrutinizing legal frameworks. I cannot fully convey how immensely privileged I feel to be able to introduce myself to all of you. My name is A.K. Shi, and I am the Volume 68 Editor-in-Chief of the UCLA Law Review. We take great pleasure in welcoming you all to our journal's 2021 symposium, Structural Inequality and the Law. This year's virtual format brings together a dynamic group of scholars and activists from across the nation. These incredible panelists join us to examine structural inequality, particularly as it relates to social movements, the concept of public safety, institutional change, and freedom dreams. As we began to plan the symposium last spring, the ground was shifting beneath our feet. We were and still are experiencing unprecedented tragedies. But in the midst of it all, we also saw an unprecedented resistance to the systems of white supremacy and subordination. There has perhaps been more conversation about the role of law than ever before. And we chose this year's topic with the intention of centering resistance movements grounded in anti-racist work and goals. We seek to highlight the scholarly work and community organizing efforts that many of our panelists engage in daily. In particular, we are excited to hear from the many activists presenting their work today so that those of us in the legal field may remind ourselves to ground our own work in the lives that are most affected by these structures and policies. Legal academia and legal discourse are too often detached from the lives affected by our scholarship. And our symposium challenges us to, as Professor Mari Matsuda put it, look to the bottom, remembering that law is a lived experience and is shaped by people across society. We are truly honored to be a part of this discussion, and it is all our hope that we all leave with a greater understanding of the oppressive structures that govern our lives in disparate ways. We should feel galvanized by the many incredible people doing this necessary work, and we must push ourselves to envision and invest in a different and more just future. Changing who sits in the Oval Office is neither the beginning nor the end of this work, because structural inequality is more than simply racist rhetoric or executive orders. It is the entire way that our society was designed to protect white supremacy and even under the guise of neutrality. And let me be clear on this point. One of the biggest myths in the law is that it can be neutral. This is not a neutral field. There can be no neutrality. Many people here today, and you know, I'll just share because I'm happy we have an incredible turnout, but 
Many people here today have very different backgrounds and degrees of involvement with critical race theory and political activism. For those still learning about how to be actively anti-racist, and let's be real, we are all still learning how to be actively anti-racist, I ask that we question the ways in which we are complicit in upholding structural inequality and that we sit with any discomfort that we might feel. And just as I invite you to sit with the discomfort, I also invite you to be brave, to recognize the incredible opportunity to provided to us by our panelists, because at its core, this symposium is about reimagining a different world, to dare us to ask what if and how things could and should be different. Now, I want to echo our symposium editor, Ryan Garcia, and her thanks to everyone who helped make this event possible. I personally still can't get over who we have participating on these panels. I mean, I can't mention every single one of them in the limited time I have now, but I remember taking a civil rights course with Kimberly Crenshaw last spring and feeling nervous and starstruck. I remember reading the scholarship of Dean Spade and feeling it resonate with me in a way that few other works have. And I remember recommending front to friends works by Osagi Obasogi to explain just why notions of color blindness and post-racialism are not only lacking, but harmful. To say the very least, I am both amazed and extremely appreciative that they agreed to join us for our symposium. And I hope you are as excited as I am to hear them speak. And as a final note, I want to specifically thank the incredible Ryan Garcia. She took on the lion's share of the work in organizing the symposium. She is a fearless, vocal powerhouse of an advocate. And over this past year, I've watched her work through hundreds and hundreds of emails, dozens of late night phone or Zoom calls, and the occasional forgotten meal. But of course, this work is unquestionably, unquestionably worthwhile because this is just the beginning of many conversations to come as we all continue to learn and unlearn as we question and dismantle the racist and oppressive systems in which our legal system was, was founded. And as Professor Amna Akbar put it, as we radically reimagine. Now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our faculty sponsor who put her heart and soul into organizing the symposium, Sunita Patel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the West Coast. Good afternoon to the East Coast. And good night to anyone joining from across the globe today. I have had the immense pleasure of working with Ryan, AK, and Professor Crenshaw to design and construct the series of conversations we will have during our symposium. The material and political dimensions of structural inequality were brought to light once again last summer. The killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor before that sparked Black-led mass uprisings and demonstrations against police violence. Social movement demands demanded reallocation of the public coffers from police and its entailments to social infrastructure and different methods of addressing harm. The events laid bare the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and structural racism. And so, as we endeavored to imagine a symposium shortly after a historic inauguration, but also without knowing if COVID-19, number 45, or white supremacist violence would upend our world before we reached this very day. Despite the ousting of a man who perpetuated and entrenched white supremacy, we find ourselves at a moment of racial reckoning. And so it is, is, it is, and so it is that we will examine the role law plays in both entrenching structural inequality and subordination, but we will also have an opportunity to reimagine structures and institutions with the help of leading scholars, grassroots organizers, and movement lawyers. This project is also about co-producing knowledge with all of you in the audience and millions of people experiencing structural inequality in all its forms. I have been mesmerized by this incredible team. Um, as AK mentioned, Ryan has tirelessly fought through endless um, hurdles of a virtual um, event and has handled it with grace um, and all that we would expect from our amazing law students at UCLA. Um, AK has been a fierce leader for the Law Review Symposium and for our um, convening team. 
I, I couldn't be more proud of them, but also more um, delighted to have been able to work with them and get to know them in, their, in this process. And now, um, if I could just take a moment to, I need, I'm, I apologize, I need to ask a question here. And so it's now my incredible honor to turn to an introduction of a woman who many will say don't, doesn't require an introduction. But I'm, I'm gonna give her one anyway. Um, she is my friend and colleague, Kimberly Crenshaw. It is my you know, pleasure to introduce her. She's one of the nation's foremost legal scholars. She is, um, she is the most cited woman legal scholar in the history of the law. In 2019, Prospect Magazine named her as one of the top 10 most important thinkers in the world. She's popularly known for having coined the term intersectionality, she is also a foundational creator of critical race theory. She's a pioneering scholar in many areas, civil rights, black feminist theory, race, racism in the law. She's also a distinguished professor at UCLA School of Law and Columbia University. She's the executive director and co-founder of African American Policy Forum. And all of these are her you know, known professional accolades. But on top of that, I would like to say she's an even better person. She has been a friend and a confidant to me. She has been, she is connected to the community and to the academy. It is um, extremely rare that we will find someone in our institutions of higher learning with a deeper or more solid commitment to our ideals and values of anti-subordination and addressing the issues of our symposium today. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it over to my, uh, to my friend and colleague, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, I understand we're having some um, technical issues at the moment. Um, I'm just going to uh, just ask that, every, that we pause for one moment and, and address that. While we have a moment for break, I just want to again address a few formatting details. We will have two American Sign Language interpreters rotating during the sessions, and they will appear automatically alongside the speakers. During the webinar for closed captioning, please click the CC icon at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. Um, thank you, and we will be ready to go in just a few minutes here. Good morning, everyone. I think we are clear to start. Uh, my name is Kimberly Crenshaw. I am a professor of law here at UCLA and the Promise Institute Chair in Human Rights. So we come together today for this law review symposium at a time in which faith in democratic institutions is at an all time low. Rhetorical commitments to law and order have given way to their underlying racial contingencies. And the United States president is under investigation for inciting a mob to invade and occupy the Capitol. And this president still enjoys the support of over 75% of the party most rhetorically committed to the so-called traditional values of American exceptionalism and the supremacy of blue lives. In the midst of a society that is now teetering between civic collapse and radical social reordering, the principal differences between the two most powerful political formations boils down not so much to a concrete plan, 
but to respective choices of a story, a heads or tails choice that springs actually from the same coin, a common conceit of a glorious and noble past that we can model again to make America great again, or a past whose reflection we must now conjure up because at the end of the day, we're all better than this. So in the middle of this crisis is the ever evolving but never absent question of racial power, having roared back to the center of political culture after its brief banishment to the never never land of post racialism. The twin pandemics of COVID and white supremacy have animated both structural and social dimensions of racial power over the last 12 months from the industrial scale of death and infection that has consumed lives that didn't matter to the shocking state enabled homicides that took the lives of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and Joy George Floyd. Millions have been activated by these tragedies, building righteous outrage and transformative energies into structures, ideologies, and organizations that have been fashioned to reimagine a world that might exist on the other side of this portal. And at the same time, a different set of millions has also been radicalized, heightening the tensions, the conflicts, and imposing narratives in a fight on how we exist. So this is the stage in which this particular set of interrogations is set. Over the course of the day, our conversation will foreground how prisms shaped by critical race theory enable a structural reading of racial power and law's relation to it. Now, um, while realities that envisioned by and pertain to CRT are newly legible in this crisis, we want to ask questions about how. How is it that critical race theory exists in this moment, not simply as a lens for reading this moment, but also as an object in the unfolding drama, a galvanizing target rounded up and framed in the loose assortment of un-American ideas that have to be utterly silenced to restore the legitimate social order. One might wonder <laughs> at this stage, how critical race theory has suddenly been given top billing as the all powerful villain in a campaign to win back America. How has CRT come to star in the MAGA story? And yet at the same time, it remains a voiceless extra in the official story of who we are. How do its stories about the structured dimensions of racial power warrant both a search and destroy mission from this country's redeemers? And at the same time, its scenes remain on the cutting room floor of the story of a reunion born out of Americans' exceptional DNA. So if we are to correct today's build back better, to build back different, if that is today's North Star, what are the legal frameworks capacious enough to respond to the scale of the crises that we face? And what is the playbook we must write collectively to facilitate a more inclusive future that captures the energies of millions who've been activated to demand it? To do that, we're going to begin by looking at the crises, um, examining the crises we face, and then we'll go back to the future to examine how legal frameworks connect to and potentially build out from this moment of reckoning. Now, um, before I introduce our esteemed panelists, um, I want to introduce the facilitator, um, host of this important symposium, uh, Sunita Patel. Sunita, would you like to give a brief welcome? Um, <clears throat> I actually, I, I, I provided my welcoming remarks already, but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Professor Crenshaw, for being here with us today. Oh, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I was not able to uh, log on and I didn't wanna just start without saying thank you for your tremendous 
leadership, Sunita, um, in pulling this important symposium together. You uh, are truly a gift to us, so thank you. So our esteemed panelists are gonna take up these and, and more questions, beginning first with annotations of the unfolding crises in the Capitol. So it's my pleasure to, wel to welcome now Amna Akbar. She's a professor in criminal law and procedure and race and inequality at Ohio State University. She's also an advisory board member of the Law for Black Lives. Uh, my colleague and sister, Cheryl Harris, she's the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at UCLA Law School and author of the seminal journal article, Whiteness as Property, among many others. Um, my OG, uh, my, I think my oldest friend in the profession, uh, Charles Chuck Lawrence, professor of law emeritus at the University of Hawaii, and one of the founding fathers of critical race theory. And last but not least, T.L. Lewis, uh, a trailblazing community lawyer and consultant who centers intersectional thought, education, and organizing within litigation that seeks to emphasize the intersections between disability, race, and class, among other marginalized identities. So welcome to everyone. So um, we're going to do this in a bit of a round table. Uh, fashion, and we're going to begin with a discussion of what stuck with you first um, in terms of either an image or a framing, a storyline around the inter insurrection that unfolded on uh, January 6th, one that um, helps us juxtapose, if you will, um, the competing narratives and then where critical race theory might be a point of uh, intervention in those competing frames. So I'm gonna start uh, with uh, Cheryl Harris um, to, to help us understand um, through some of these images, the, the competing narratives that uh, are playing out currently. So Cheryl. Well, thank you, Kim, for the introduction and thank you, Sunita and to the Law Review staff for providing this platform I'm sure at the time that this was planned, we could not have necessarily known what was going to unfold, but it seems as though the events, uh, particularly of January 6th, um, <clears throat> really for me, mark why this conversation is so important. And the image that is particularly salient and disturbing for me remains the man carrying the Confederate flag through the halls of Congress. You know, as many have noted before, despite a protracted and bloody civil war, that has never happened before. Um, and considering what I think it is a manifestation of what it represents, it's a kind of convergence of the new loss caused with the old loss cause, which to some extent is the same. Uh, that is the elevation and embrace of white supremacy over democratic processes and principles. And this has been a tension uh, from the time of the founding it's often been expressed through violence, the violent refusal of the Confederacy to accept defeat and to acknowledge the end of slavery. And here we have the violent refusal not to not only not to accept the results of an election, but to accept the basic rules of democracy if it means relinquishing white supremacy and white dominance. And so for me, I, I hear when I see that image, the echoes of Justice Harlan uh, and his dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson the case where the court famously upheld state imposed segregation uh, as equal treatment. Blacks can't sit on cars reserved for whites. Whites can't sit on cars reserved for blacks. That's all equal protection guarantees. And while Harlan is chiding them in his dissent and saying, no, actually the reconstruction amendments represented a rejection of racial caste, our constitution is colorblind, he said. And this becomes, of course, in our modern times, an embodiment of the doctrinal and political position on race that has been most salient over the last 30 years. Um, it's embedded, that affirmation of colorblindness is embedded in some language that I actually just wanna read because it, it, it keeps sticking in my head. So as a prelude to his commitment to colorblindness, Harlan says, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. And so it is in prestige in achievements in education and wealth and power. So I doubt not it will continue to be, but in the view of the constitution, there is in this country, no dominant ruling class, there is no caste 
our constitution as colorblind. So here Harlan is advancing the idea that colorblindness, formal race neutrality, can be consistent with white dominance. Uh, there is a way in which um, equal protection can then be rationalized with white supremacy and, and uh, all that structural inequality that Harlan names can be considered consistent with constitutional guarantees. So I'm saying that I think that tension, that contradiction is com it comes up for me when I see that image. Great. And, and we, I want to come back around to uh, ask if there are other images that amplify the uh, deeper historical narrative, um, the way that that logic has been integrated into Americana. Um, so I think our images are coming up shortly, but, but let me let me put a pin in that um, and bring Chuck in. Um, Chuck, what what image or what point of departure would you want to begin with from uh, the events of January the sixth? Is is Chuck uh, unmuted? Not yet. Okay. It is the Zoom world that we. Yeah, are I'm telling you. <laughs> as you say, the old guys, it's really rough on us. <laughs> All of us, like it's what's an happening? Immigrant, immigrant generation to this. Well, well, you know, we when we show, we show. So, <laughs> hey, Chuck. So. Uh, I think you know all of these images um, are are coming to mind for me, um, and and really it's sort of the the looks on the faces um, and the language of righteousness and patriotism that the, that these um, white men mostly who invaded um, uh, the capital uh, for me. Um, and, and this language of a stolen election, you know, that they really saw themselves uh, not as criminal, uh, but, and not as outlaws, but they believed they were uh, God's army reclaiming this country, you know, and this goes so much together with this whole mantra of, of make America great again. Um, and I think for me, even the word stolen election, you know, to me, um, you know, take me right back to Dred Scott, you know, a case about stolen property, you know, and, and uh, that the constitution begins with blacks as property, right? And, uh, and, uh, and begins with whites as, as owners of property, right? So that always in our work as critical race theorists, um, the, the central question has been membership in the polity, right? And so to have this image of these people coming to what, what commentators kept calling the, the people's house, mm. right? Uh, and their real feeling was, you know, the people's house is a white house, you know, not, not, not the white house, but even the capital it, it's the house of what is really America, which is white America, which is where the constitution begins. The constitution is quite clear about that before the reconstruction amendments, right? Uh, and, uh, and so there is still this continuing belief uh, in uh, whiteness as essential to membership in the polity. Right. And this, the notion of the stolen election is, you know, it doesn't matter what the numbers were. These people aren't even spoke. These people who voted, who were black and brown and, and people on the margin, even women aren't even supposed to be in the polity. Um, so I think that uh, this claiming of what was rightfully theirs is something that the law has continued to participate in, uh, in its denial of structural uh, uh, inequality. So that there's both um, uh, this claim, as Cheryl says, of colorblindness, uh, but there's not only uh, putting those both together, but there's never uh, really a rejection of, you know, the court all the way through 
continues to deny that this country has this racist ideology really that says you know, that only whites are people and only people are citizens, only people, people with the capacity for governance are part of, uh, uh, part of democracy. Uh, and the ideology of white supremacy uh, is bolsters this, you know, the structural, the structural racism in the beginning was very clear and very apparent. You know, that's what, that's what um, Justice Taney says in Dred Scott. You know, we all know that this is a country uh, that excludes these people who are incapable of being in the polity. Um, and so I, I think what, what came to mind to me was that, you know, of course, you know, this is what uh, this is what this is about. People who have continued to be told that told this message that um, uh, we were never supposed to be there. You know, I, I think that's that's why the um, the this begins. You know, Trump begins with this uh, saying. You know that you know his whole campaign begins with Obama's alienness, you know, he, he's not really an American. And I think blacks are considered, and, and certainly all other people of color that follow are considered by nature alien, you know, not, not a part of the polity. And that, that that narrative continues. And it's a narrative that critical race theory has been central in talking about how this narrative justifies the structural inequalities that these yeah. people um, are not deserving of full membership uh, and never have been, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so the, the argument is whether we're really going to fulfill, you know, we make a claim about what the reconstruct what real reconstruction is about. And we're still in this, it's still in this thing, you know, when you say uh, we're not making America better, better, but making America new. Uh, you know, we're, we're still engaged in the struggle for the real reconstruction, you know, that we're that the final, what I call the final reconstruction, <laughs> uh, where we're in, indeed full members of the polity and uh, have full access to the material and um, goods of society. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, Cheryl and Chuck, you, you've, you've brought into this contemporary conversation um, the contestation over what equality uh, guarantees um, all the way uh, from the first reconstruction to this moment. Um, and in particular, the kind of curious way in which e even in the immediate aftermath of uh, of emancipation, uh, the law as interpreted by the Supreme Court uh, framed equality as reverse discrimination. You know, President Johnson framed, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau and, and, and basic rights to equality as taking away from the white man to give to uh, the freedmen uh, and women. So um, fascinating as I read and look at some of these symbols like, uh, you know, make, Amer make uh, elections fair again, this is our house, that same kind of sort of ideological investment in a social structure, um, which has uh, always been grounded in the prior uh, rights and uh, property interests of whites and others sort of fall in line. What I think was so fascinating and what makes some people struggle with it is that when we talk about whiteness, um, uh, people hear white people and thus when they see people of color in the Capitol, they think, oh, well, you're wrong, right? This, was, this had nothing to do with whiteness. These symbols, you know, um, sort of demanded the attention of a wide cross section uh, of people. So um, this can't really be an expression of uh, or a facilitation of white supremacy. So at least, you know, I guess a third dimension of what we have to talk about um, is critical race perspectives uh, on whiteness is not of course, merely a biological 
uh, project, but a deeply ideological one that can expand its boundaries as Trumpism has allowed it to do. Um, so in, in some ways, uh, some of the themes of critical race theory um, are playing out all over again in a broad enough um, spectrum of moments and, and uh, expressions for a wider public to be aware of it. Um, I want to I want to bring TL in on this now because again I want everyone's initial thought about an image um, and how it relates to the critical. Uh, work that you do. Um, and of course, um, uh, racial power is expressed through uh, other uh, uh, hierarchies as well. So I'm really curious to know what you take away from what you saw on January 6th. This is TL. Um, first, I just want to offer gratitude for you all having me in this session with you all. Um, I very much uh, look up to and admire all of your work and thought and practice. And um, so I just want to name that. And I'm extremely anxious. So uh, the words might fumble, but um, please bear with me. Um, I, I want to name the entirety of the um, of the witnessing as um, deeply problematic and, and deeply painful for marginalized people who have been targeted uh, since time immemorial for righteous protest, for righteous indignation, um, for righteous uh, rebellion. Um, and I talk a lot about how white supremacy is in fact the, uh, it includes the theft of the legitimate emotions of, I can't see the interpreter. Um, the, the theft of the legitimate emotions of um, maimed and terrorized people uh, and the glorification, magnification, uh, dramaturgy of uh, illegitimate uh, so-called emotions and feelings of white power holders um, and, and a use of whiteness as um, excuse for violence, further violence and further terror against black indigenous low and no income folks and other folks who are otherwise marginalized. Um, and so for me, it was the entire scene of it, uh, especially coming off of our uprisings, um, especially during 2020, where we literally sacrificed lives to be in the streets, in protest, uh, in carceral spaces, in protest of um, perpetual murder, neglect, um, and violence against Black, and negatively racialized folks, uh, specifically in the broader populace of, of, um, of oppressed and, 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 and intentionally dispossessed uh, community members. So I think I just wanna name the entirety of it and uh, recontextualize um, that this has been going on for generations upon generations and for folks who felt um, uh, out of sorts and out of their body minds as a result of witnessing all of that, that that is in fact a real uh, thing and it makes practical sense for us to be feeling uh, in those ways and um, so just kind of naming that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Amna, let, let's round out our initial round by uh, getting your sense of what you saw or what resonated um, in the Capitol, either in terms of, um, you know, the activism uh, that we've been seeing these days, activism, you know, is uh, is is an is a it is on all sides, right? Um, and we kind of see the power uh, of narrative, the power of a sense of the world that people want uh, playing out. That just happened to be um, tremendous activism on behalf of the world that many of us don't want. Um, tell us about what you saw or what resonated from the January 6th debacle. Yeah, thanks, Kim, and thanks to the UCLA Law Review. It's such an honor to be here with Kim and Chuck and Cheryl and TL, all people who have learned a tremendous amount from. Um, so with this question of the image, I think of a couple of images in contrast. I think of Jake Angeli, the QAnon, the so-called QAnon sh sh shaman, oh, yeah. um, the images of the Black and Latino workers cleaning up after the people who stormed the Capitol, 
and the police holding doors open, and we know now after the fact, many of whom participated as protesters. Thinking about these images together poses many contradictions at issue in the body politic today. The relationship between the spectacular and mundane modes of violence and exploitation, like Derricka Purnell powerfully wrote about in The Guardian, the relationship between race, class, and gender, questions of essential workers and labor, who does the work of allowing the country to function, and questions of history and the now, long historical arcs of anti-Blackness, of race and capitalism, and the particularities of now in terms of neoliberalism and how it's co-constituted co by mass criminalization. Who does this social order, this rule of law protect? To whom does it give power? How does it actually work? And of course, these are questions that critical race theory has long attended to. We're living through a moment in the US where the very terrain under our feet is in question to whom it belongs, is it property or land, the infrastructures of life and death, from policing to healthcare to housing, work and the environment. And whereas for black, brown, poor, working class, incarcerated people, disabled people, these questions are often very close to the surface. For elites and lawyers, these questions often feel relatively more obscure. We contort ourselves to seeing the homeless person on the street or driving by the local jail or going into work at the courthouse where prosecutions, evictions, deportations are being effectuated, where so many of the lawyers and judges are white and relatively wealthy, those being evicted, deported, prosecuted are black, brown, disabled, working class, poor. And where of course black and brown people are being assaulted in their dignity and their access to basic necessities of life. But COVID and the lack of response to it by the state has exposed, denaturalized, intensified both longstanding formations of racial inequality and the particular brutality imposed by the neoliberal state invested in private property, markets, the accumulation of capital by the few and invested in police, prisons and jail, divested from meeting the needs of everyday people with particularly brutal impacts on black and brown people. And of course, the protests against George Floyd's murder were a rebellion against this racialized order and how it justifies widespread plunder, deprivation and violence. And then the police response to that in contrast to the lack of police response, the Capitol reamplified those underlying conditions in question. So what does it have to do with the Viking hat? The Viking hat feels to me in a sense, a spectacle of the crisis, but it also symbolizes white people um, kind of projecting um, or rather knowing that the questions of what it means to be a citizen of the United States, the very meaning of the US project, the larger colonial and capitalist project that it's in question today, right? So Charles Mills writes about how ignorance about enslavement, colonialism and their ongoing present, ignorance of those things is central to the ability of white supremacy to function. And right now I think that ignorance of these histories and its questions is at risk of being broken, which is precisely why Trump issues the executive order banning critical race theory. Um, it could not be more clear right now that the shape of the state is not working for most people. And so the Viking cap, the USA flag on his face, the animal fleece on his head, feels like an effort to kind of double down a kind of la 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 kind of we are not listening. <laughs> Understood in this way, it's less surprising, I think, that it's not poor whites that stormed the Capitol. It's middle and upper class uh, whites like Adam Server has written about in the Atlantic, reasserting their power and their dominance and their righteousness for themselves and others in a fundamental conflict between a range of political, economic and social forces. Thank you for, for, for that reading and, and particularly, um, you know, the way you, you've put together the spectacle dimension uh, with the actual project uh, of reasserting uh, the existing power relations. It is, I think, particularly notable how distracting um, the spectacle dimension was given how many of the commentators seem to um, see uh, the, the spectacle as somehow taking away from the seriousness and the threat um, that was reflected. And that in turn is a reflection of how little the history of uh, white supremacy in particular is read, its symbols, its imagery, its carnivalesque uh, dimensions. We live through a period in history in which um, uh, coups occurred in precisely the same kind of celebratory way um, that we see playing out here. So it's only through a denial 
you know, of that history that commentators could read the Capitol is reflecting just uh, letting off some steam as though that is um, not mutually uh, constitutive of killing uh, people and um, uh, uh, basically uh, rejecting biracial democratic practices. Um, so as we're speaking about history and the executive order, Cheryl, I want to come back around to you. And, you know, I guess as, as um, people who can give oldies but goodies, I want to, I want to pull out your, uh, your, one of your oldie but goodies that I think has particular salience in this moment. Um, so in whiteness is property, you, you offered an analysis that broke the chokehold um, that, uh, as we recall, the anti-essentialist wing of CLS had on our ability to um, ground a project of, of, of theorizing race um, without essentializing the notion of race. It was sort of, you know, once the critique that race was socially constructed was launched, the idea was that there was nothing more that could be said <laughs> after that. Um, and so among the many amazing things that your article did, um, you provided a way for us to understand law's role um, in constructing race, racial value, um, insulating it, allowing it to be deployed, um, and 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 having that deployment um, be insulated by law, reproduced through law, and structured uh, throughout our society. Um, what I'm really uh, struck by is um, how the various investments in whiteness that we now see running rampant uh, in the capital and elsewhere. Uh, play those observations forward, um, along with its um, relationship to our folks supposedly on our side, liberals and progressives, who A, never really got the argument, and B, uh, uh, defend against our efforts to dismantle the tight relationship uh, between whiteness and uh, particular ideologies, the ability to express um, those ideologies through government power, which was what that executive order was. So how do we make sense of all of this in this contemporary moment? How do you play it forward? Wow, Kim, what a question. Um, but thank you for the shout out. Uh, at the you are the end. only and person guess, who can answer that. Um, <laughs> I would start by thinking about um, whiteness as an edifice, um, mm -hmm. as um, something that has is built and constantly being rebuilt. And part of what we're seeing is a crisis, as I think Amna was alluding to, particular crises um, that um, occasion violence and anxiety and a need to restore value. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that existing events, either at the global or local level, place it under stress or challenge it, um, there's a need to sort of restore value. So for me, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is kind of part of the through line. Um, when I think about that image of the man with the Confederate flag, I also think about Trump at Mount Rushmore uh, on the 4th of July in the middle of the pandemic, upholding and embracing and celebrating the nation's birthday at one of the more visible sites of native dispossession and appropriation, giving a speech denouncing what he calls the merciless campaign to wipe out our history, defame our heroes, erase our values and indoctrinate our children. They think we're weak, he says, but we're strong. Uh, this is actually his call to arms that gets answered on January 6th. I think a lot of people look at the immediate speech, which was obviously a precipitating factor, but the groundwork for this had been done um, many, many months before uh, and really reflected the degree to which um, he, and, and as Anna alluded to, was setting up a platform in which to exercise government power to actually enter an attack on anti-racist thinking and speech. Now, a lot of times people look at this and say, well, you know, it's just words. Uh, 
it couldn't be further from the truth. There was nothing um, sort of plainly rhetorical or simply rhetorical about that assault. The banning of the use of words that critique structural racism, the banning of, critical, of, of even critical race theory itself as a concept. Um, you know, there were a lot of people, some of us uh, uh, included here at, at UCLA and elsewhere, who uh, denounced this move as dangerous, and, uh, but there was really not a lot of recognition, I think, or uptake at the time that, of what this really represented, but it really represented a codification, a legitimation, the use of state power to silence. Uh, and the fact that this is done um, by the federal government, obviously this order has now been overruled, or, or I, I guess I should say rescinded, does not take away the underlying sort of ideological assault that it represents. And partly the problem lies in the ways in which the doctrine of First Amendment law and the way in which we talk about it even in political terms places anti-racist speech and racist speech on the same normative and political uh, domain or, or the same field, meaning that neither one is considered to be uh, uh, both are considered to be uh, uh, technically protected, but not, one is not supposed to be um, subordinate to the other as though the 14th, the, the reconstruction amendments never happened. Mm -hmm. So you have what I have been calling a kind of plessification of the first amendment, the same way that Harlan says that whites can remain dominant under a regime in which uh, formal segregation is eliminated, structural inequality can continue you have in the context of thinking about speech, this way in which Trump's speech uh, immediately before the Capitol assault is considered by many to be protected speech. Uh, and yet by the same token, the voices of critique are subject to being periodically banned. Now I know that um, court order has come about as a result of litigation that had in fact, even before Biden took office, uh, issued an injunction against that executive order. But the underlying question of whether or not the government can exercise its power in this way, to my understanding, is still, uh, I guess I would say, has not been repudiated. And the idea that the government can in fact marshal its power to suppress anti-racist speech um, actually enables not only the question of what people legally will do, but what people think they must do in order to avoid a problem. So you have the sort of issues of over compliance, even in the absence of an official executive order. Who among the grantees and recipients of federal funds will shy away from a critique of structural inequality precisely because they want to avoid this problem. I just saw uh, something today right before coming to the panel that there's somebody out here now who's creating a list of institutions and places that are engaged in critical race theory. Uh, obviously this person is not sitting in government right now, but it has to do with sort of creating and again, uh, underwriting the ideological notion that um, any kind of thought or speech that attempts to um, pierce that ignorance, like the 1619 project, like critical race theory, is itself a radical ideology that has to be suppressed. Right. And you know, you you uh, rightly point out that the the list making may not be done now by the federal government, but we have reason to believe, you know, that there are other forces uh, to be concerned about. Um, that are amassing in, in ways to, um, uh, I guess, you, quite honestly, just suppress a uh, critique of, of the, the current social order. The, the actual language of the, the executive order did it itself by basically saying um, cr criticisms, projects that uh, make uh, one group feel uh, guilty or one group feel um, as though you know they are responsible. These, this is basically the uh, consequence of telling uh, certain truths about how our society came to look the way it does, what are the ways in which um, certain 
uh, privileges and preferences are structured. These are all the ideas that are now, you know, I call it the new McCarthyism. They're the, the ideas that are un-American that cannot be tolerated and are consequently, you know, subject to um, censure. Um, Can I just make yeah. one uh, little point? And I, I totally agree, but I think one of the things that also was is particularly concerning to me is, you know, that kind of attack on uh, anti-racist speech has a long historical trajectory. So there's nothing particularly surprising about that. What is, in fact, I think troubling to me is the extent to which in terms of our dominant understanding of law and political discourse, people continue to sort of say, well, the answer uh, you know, the attack on anti-racist speech um, actually is still being framed within the notion that anti-racist speech has no greater value than racist speech. And therefore, under the existing framework, quote unquote, both are protected, much in the same way, as I said before, with regard to Plessy, um, it, that they both sit on the same normative and political and doctrinal plane. And that, to me, helps, uh, or, or that to me is actually the greater danger because it means that with respect to responding to it, we are disabled uh, sometimes by, um, by very well-meaning people who articulate this kind of view of the First Amendment and speech that simply says, well, the answer is um, you just speak back. But of mm -hmm. course, in this circumstance, that's exactly what was being taken away. And now even in the absence of official oppression, you have a kind of mobilization of a certain kind of argument in which the delegitimation of anti-racist speech is considered to be a, a patriotic project. Uh, and the defense of anti-racist speech is completely disabled. So I couldn't do a better pivot myself to you, Chuck. So um, we, there's, first of all, the, the question of some strange bedfellows uh, in, uh, activating this executive order. Um, and, and I would even go more uh, into the history of some of the very same forces that um, were uh, unwilling to provide support uh, for efforts to rein in uh, assault to speech, suddenly getting uh, in the position of supporting a, an executive order uh, that uh, effectively silences anti-racist speech. So I want you to say something about it because one of those institutions, you know, appears on your CV. Um, but more broadly, um, as, as Cheryl was pointing out, this isn't just, you know, or even primarily a left-right debate. It's a different kind of, of struggle. So I wonder if you can speak to that. Yeah, Kim, I, th I think, um, you know, Kim's referring immediately to the fact that, um, you know, this goes back, uh, as um, Alma mentioned, uh, you know, a long time. And uh, even much, you know, it goes all, all the way back to, you know, to Reconstruction. And certainly before that, you know, it goes, goes all the way back to, um, to barring, um, enslaved people, you know, from reading and speaking at all, right? So always uh, the the silencing of um, of this what Emma talked about in terms of 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 the silencing of voices that would remove this ignorance about our past, about our current situation. Um, that this is, uh, you know, has always been part of the political project, right? Um, the the other thing that so that we had this situation where, um, on the one hand, Stanford University was going to great lengths. We were trying to um, say that uh, one couldn't be receive an education in a situation in which one was subjected to racist speech. Suddenly, there was there was this same you know Stanford put out initially a memo uh, from their human um, services division uh, um, promoting the executive order and 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 supporting this notion of um, of anti racist speech as in some way um, denying rights of of people um, 
at the university. Uh, but the thing that I that I want to come back to, um, which is related to this, is the way that um, the the violence that TL um, talked about experiencing uh, and this uh, uh, ideological effort, you know, this effort that um, that bans racist speech that speaks of that as terrorist that um, that is what you as, as you mentioned part of the whole reverse discrimination battle how those come together in that uh, what we know about structural racism is um, that that these structures of oppression the things that Emma mentioned deprive us you know you know subject us to police violence, uh, subject us to mass incarceration, subject us to segregated and inadequate schools and lack of health care. All of those um, kinds of structural racism have always been imposed by violence, right? And one of the things that really struck me, and, and um, Tali was mentioning this, that struck me about those images on, on, on the 6th, January 6th, were, were um, that uh, so many white folks were talking about this as if they were shocked, you know, they were shocked by, you know, here were all these white folks coming like the Klan, you know, and, and I think for people of color, we felt, uh, you know, like they told, this is the way it was, they told us they were coming, you know, the Klan would say, you know, you guys, you know, you step out of line, you start talking about anti-racism, we're coming for you, right? And, and even the executive order is not just an ideological move to, to, to say that anti-racist speech is reverse discrimination, but it's also was a move to, um, to you know, threaten us with violence. Mm -hmm. you know, this was, you know, it wasn't, you know, when they named critical race theory, when they named the 1619 project, you no, know, Kim knows this. Maury and I took our phones and emails off of the website at the University of Hawaii. And lots of people, you know, th that this was, he was specifically saying to people, these same people who came to the Capitol, right? So this uh, is both about how racism has always has initially been imposed this the plunder the extermination imposed by private violence sanctioned by state violence right and so that there's both the element of the ideological project right of saying that this is this is who America is. This is white America. These people do not belong. The ideological project of saying that uh, anti-racist speech uh, is no different than racist speech. This is about you know we're, we've always been fighting about whether the um, the Fourteenth Amendment, the Reconstruction Amendments, impose an affirmative duty to move from structural conditions of oppression to full equality and also an affirmative duty to combat the ideology that justifies that, um, that oppression, right? So that I wrote, you know, in the first article I wrote about racist speech, I talk about how Brown is a case about speech, right? Because Brown did the did the um, talked about the structures that banned black children from schools that had the material resources, right? In the same way that we were banned from reading as slaves. But it also talked about the ideological project of saying that excluding these children um, stigmatize them, label them as inferior, that segregation was always about that ideological project as well, right? So I think that it's important to see 
the way that every one of these things, including the executive order, is the mobilization of both an ideological project and a project of violence. Uh, and this has always been the twin, you know, the, the twins of, of racism, you know, that, that it's not, that structure is maintained uh, by this ideological project of right supremacy and also by violence. And, and one doesn't happen without the other, that we, we, aren't, um, uh, we aren't convinced, you know, not to leave the plantation simply because we're, you know, someone convinces us that we're inferior and we are not freedom. No, what's behind it is the fact that you are going to be hung, you know, hung from a tree, right? Uh, and, uh, and that continues to be the case that all of every time we look at these projects, we have to see the way that the law um, validates and authorizes the violence, both the private violence and the state violence itself when it occurs by police. So that, that when we see George Floyd killed, murdered by a policeman, and then we see you know, Trayvon murdered by a private institution, these are both forms of state violence, right? Uh, and, and this is what uh, slavery was about. It was you know, constitutionalized state violence as a means of maintaining structures of oppression and inequality. So thank you, Chuck. On, on, on that note, I want to bring Amna back because, um, you know, the conversation that so many of people have been a part of and, and, and you've been a, an incredible voice in it is to think about what the uh, limits of liberal legal thinking have been um, and how they're being challenged in the contemporary movements, uh, movements for black lives, movements for sustainability, movements um, uh, for equity and justice across any number of issues and how they're coming together. So um, help us um, understand how some of these uh, movements are, are, are showing and reflecting alternative ways of thinking about social movements and alternative ways of thinking about laws relationship to them. Yeah, thanks for that, Kim. So we've been focused so far in part on the capital. And so in a sense, the kind of um, intensification of right-wing politics. But of course, one of the things that's really exciting and important about the moment is the growth and in numbers and power of a broader left fighting for gender justice, racial justice, economic justice in a really intersectional and important way. And so here you can think of the proliferation and growth of new and old formations like the Movement for Black Lives, Critical Resistance, Dream Defenders, Sunrise Movement, the growth of bail funds and mutual aid networks, Mehente, Working Families Party, the Democratic Socialists of America and more. And um, initially I was intrigued in 2014 after the Ferguson rebellion um, and the kind of the um, growth of Black Lives Matter with the way that um, racial justice organizations were relating to and thinking about laws that they were very much in relationship with critical race theory. And of course, Kim, your work would say her name is important part of that story, um, but that they were relating to law in ways that seem to me to kind of enrich and expand um, the way that liberal legalism thinks about law. So here I wanna outline a couple of ways that I think social movements are relating to law. And I'd be curious, TL, if you, what you think about this, if you have a moment to respond. But um, so one is this, it's law um, in a broader, way. So often in law schools and among lawyers, we focus on constitutionalism, on rights, on litigation, on legislation. Um, and I think this has changed a little bit in the last six months with the election, and we can talk about that. But up until then, um, it seemed to me, you know, that contemporary progressive social movements were focused on legal institutions as theaters of protest 
So for example, against police killings and police brutality. So sometimes that took the form of literal protest and rallies. Um, sometimes that took the form of Mama's Day bailouts. So bailing out, uh, for example, black women um, as a way to bring attention to the anti-black and um, you know, classed way that incarceration and criminalization work. But it also include, includes tactics like creating chains around housing courts to block evictions or occupying the office of Nancy Pelosi to launch the Green New Deal, right? So engaging with legal institutions as sites and theaters of protest. And then secondly, as sites for demands in ways that also challenge our notion of what law and law reform are. Here I'm thinking of demands like defund the police or no new jails, um, which we can talk about in more detail, but in their very form, centrally posit jails, prisons, and police as legal institutions in ways that I think in law, we don't tend to think of it, that you know, kind of like this is the, the material infrastructure of what the law looks like. And so it becomes um, you know, a place to challenge and to posit, you know, like what else could we do with these buildings, for example, could we build housing? So that's one thing is law in a broader way. The second thing is law in context, right? So often, you know, um, and this is, you know, like movement lawyers today, uh, and of course, critical race theory has long challenged this, but to understand law as one strategy and tactic alongside a range of other strategies and tactics that movements and people fighting for social justice use. So that includes mutual aid, transformative justice processes, the building of social movement organizations or left parties. So understanding law in that context feels really important. And then the third thing is law as defensive and a affirmative strategy towards a distant, bold and beautiful horizon. So law in itself, not as the end goal. So in the face of kind of racial and gendered capitalism, law is used um, or legal strategy and tactics are kind of deployed in service of a broader set of aims, right? To throw the system in crisis, to contribute and intensify the crisis, to stand in solidarity with people who are being assaulted by legal process through eviction, deportation, prosecution, and so on, to build modes of social organization like I was talking about, to organize for non-reformist reforms. And you know, in terms of the horizon point, I think obviously, you know, I'm kind of painting a big picture, and there's all sorts of shades and contradictions within this work, but generally speaking, a lot of these social left social movement organizations, in my view, kind of you see this kind of increasingly coherent if they're with tension and contradiction kind of horizon towards an abolitionist future, an anti-capitalist future, an anti-colonial future. And so all of these organizations I talked about and, and plus many more like the Red Nation, for example, have really been putting out incredible work, not just an analysis, not just through protest signs and their use of tactics and strategies, which they're doing, but also through really important policy platforms and thought papers and so on. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna build on uh, your um, calling TL uh, to uh, comment as well. Um, in particular, so, so what I'm um, uh, lifting up from and hearing from what you're saying is the, the building on, the building out, the building around, the building through, um, legal formations to uh, facilitate the energy towards transformative realities. And um, in it is both a critique and a set of possibilities that, that um, folks are exploring. Um, uh, TL, um, talk to us about, about your work, um, particularly with respect to how does the prevailing legal disability rights framework fall short? Um, and uh, what is the, the framing of the medical carceral industrial complex that you work with and through um, as a site of, of integrating critical race theory and, and other frameworks into your work? This is TL. So I, I really want to name that no conversation about dismantling white supremacy can be had um, without centering ableism. So a lot of the things that have been named today um, are actually quite literally discussing ableism 
um, through a racialized lens, for example, or through a uh, gendered lens. Um, but so I want to take us back a quick step so I can kind of ground us in what is ableism. And I think this is just an invitation for everybody to um, reconceptualize what uh, you know and think about ableism. So Professor Lawrence mentioned that Black uh, enslaved peoples were uh, deprived of access to reading and writing, for example. Um, that is, in fact, a form of uh, disablement, intentional disablement, if we understand the normative society around who is of value, who is smart, who is intelligence, based on societal constructions of intelligence, right? And so taking a step back, Ableism is in fact the oldest and most pervasive and radical form of oppression. Um, and it has to be understood as at the heart of every form of oppression, especially um, racism. Um, what the short of it is what, what, what ableism is, is like the, it's the categorization and valuation or devaluation of people, minds, bodies, behaviors based on societal constructions of normative and non-normative, uh, pathological or acceptable, uh, deviant and uh, acceptable, for example. And so when we read, when we, and, and importantly, um, all of these valuations uh, necessitate having racism, anti-Blackness, capitalism at their heart. They're based on ideas of traditional um, ideologies around who is of value based on capitalist constructs and racist constructs on body, minds, and behaviors. That is why we see white people running rampant in the capital, um, why their behaviors are not pathologized, criminalized, um, deemed insanity, quite literally escape from enslavement is deemed insanity and criminal simultaneously, uh, resisting arrest, insanity and criminal simultaneously, right? Like, so all of these things are connected in ways that folks often haven't understood. Um, so um, now moving forward, um, understanding the, the, and I guess I should say that within disability rights communities, there's also a white supremacy problem, wherein white people have taken it upon themselves to own disability in a way that is quite racist, quite classist, quite ableist, and so on and so forth. And so what we find is um, white folks have generally the, the broader mainstream white disability rights society communities have framed disability and ableism as belonging to particular people. You have to have these kinds of um, characteristics to be deemed disabled or to be deemed acceptably disabled and to have access to a lot of the things that federal disability rights laws uh, say are necessary to um, be accept acceptable enough disabled to receive accommodations, for example, under the ADA, right? You might need insurance to get to the doctor, to get to uh, the diagnosis, to get to proof enough of having that disability. Importantly, uh, marginalized, especially racially marginalized folks usually don't have access uh, to those, those capital, whether that be social capital, whether that be actual capital wealth resources um, to be deemed disabled enough to gain access to those things. And um, also just the way the law works, you all understand in terms of litigation is quite de-radicalizing. So in disability rights litigation under the ADA, for example, um, might seek to make solitary confinement more accessible as opposed to saying uh, no disabled folks, really no one, but certainly no disabled folks should be in uh, confined in solitary confinement, for example, because we know it's torture for everyone. Let's not tinker with the machinations of violence. Let's disband that or same with standardized testing, which are actually ableist, racist, classist, and otherwise problematic. Um, disability rights litigation might say, oh, let's hire an interpreter, let's sue and get an interpreter so standardized test so-and-so can make this uh, particular standardized test accessible to Joe, the wealth privileged deaf person, as opposed to saying, oh, let's look at all the people who are harmed by standardized tests. Looks like every marginalized community that ever existed. Let's dismantle that. Let's be in solidarity and work to dismantle um, all of the strictures and structures, ideologies and practices around that, that, that bar people from having basic access to things like education. Um, so I think I'll stop there. I hope that was clear, but yeah, I just- yeah. I, so l let me ask you this, this follow up. Um, so um, one of the points of departure initially for critical race theory was over the critique of rights, right? We did, it was a big 
uh, debate about the fact that when we look to law as a site for potential intervention against the forces that we are uh, contesting, whether they be racism, patriarchy, the intersections of those, um, we inherently engage in a rhetorical discourse that limits the imaginary possibilities, that um, reproduces the logics of our uh, oppression. Yet for us at that time, there was, this is true. And it is also true that there is no space outside of conventional uh, uh, political legal discourse. Our goal is to try to engage this as a way of um, um, making interventions that are transformative. And now we're at a moment where we have to reconsider, was that a wrong, was that a wrong move, <laughs> right? Um, and I, and I'm, I'm very curious as to whether um, in the movement, um, particularly in the traditional disability rights movement, is there a similar kind of debate? And are there ways in which you have engaged law that are um, that you have confidence in aren't subject to the same kind of you use this it 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 basically will undermine the broader project that you're trying to achieve how have you witnessed or seen this debate play out This is T.I. I appreciate that follow-up question. And, and this is when I get to honor my Black, Indigenous, trans, disabled elders uh, who created disability justice for us as another framework um, from which to understand our lived experiences as uh, negatively racialized, queer, trans, disabled people. Um, so in the same way that you and your communities and generations prior to my birth, thank you, um, <laughs> we're thinking through what were the limitations, what are the limitations of the law? Um, how are they constraining our actual liberation despite its uh, stated attempts to do the opposite? Um, and I have to name again with appropriation, what happened with disability rights was a lot of appropriation of civil rights laws for black folks. So in, in fact, the ADA looks quite similar to um, civil rights legislation of the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, and so it's important to remember that because that framework is quite similar, the same um, tensions that exist with the civil rights frameworks around LGBTQI rights, uh, black, uh, racial justice, et cetera, based on the right side, apply also to disability rights side. So some of the elders in Black, um, Black Indigenous elders who develop um, disability justice are Leroy Moore out of the Bay Area, Patty Byrne, all of these folks are mostly out of the Bay Area, um, Eli Clare, Mia Mingus. Um, and the idea with disability justice is that we're not seeking to um, just modify or provide accommodations for one individual person or even a subset of the disability community. Um, we're looking to um, uproot the entire systems and structures of violence and oppression and intentional neglect um, that make it such that Black disabled people, especially Indigenous disabled people, especially. And it's important to name that Black and Indigenous people who do not identify as disabled experience ableism every day because it is based in racism, anti-Blackness, capitalism, et cetera. Um, and so my definition of ableism moves us away from this very white-centric, very unnuanced explanation of what ableism is and says it doesn't matter actually if you're disabled. We, everyone on this screen has experienced ableism and that's because of how society is constructed and that every single framework that everyone has mentioned here, whether that be capitalism, um, deprivation of, of health access and so on and so forth, the ideas behind it are that there are certain people who are deserving of access, certain people who are not deserving of access, certain people who are valuable, certain people who are not valuable. And through that structure and through that framework, whether that be a racialized, genderized, or some other framework, we decide to deprive people of resources, to allow people to die, to intentionally kill people off, to incarcerate 
um, in other ways. And in incarceration includes enslavement and forced um, living on reservations, et cetera. All of these things have to be understood. And you mentioned the medical carceral industrial complex. That's something I don't disconnect, though most people will talk about them separately. And that's because ableism is quite literally at the heart of all of the things we're all talking about right now. And so if we were all to work to dismantle ableism, we couldn't have any other form of systemic oppression. Um, and racism couldn't exist without ableism and vice versa. So they are the heartbeat of each other. Um, they are quite literally at the heart of the anatomy of, of all of those things. So I'm hoping that folks can really expand how they understand ableism, not to be confused with disableism, which directly affects disabled people. Ableism affects all folks who have been intentionally marginalized, excluded, uh, dispossessed, neglected um, by all of the structures and including the law, uh, even when it states opposite um, by our society, by corporations, by our government and state. Amazing. Thank you for that, T.L. Um, and Cheryl, I, I, I want to come back to you and, and ask a version of the question as well and, and think of this sort of transition to more or less our intergenerational dialogue, right? So um, I, I know some of, the, some of the debates that I talked about just a few minutes ago and, and earlier um, are familiar to, to, to us. And I'm, um, I'm wondering how we play it through to, to this moment. Now, this whole panel is about uh, structural, uh, structural inequality, uh, and the law, and we've been looking at it from a critical uh, race prism. Um, and I, I'm wondering how we think think about this moment. Um, and I'm going to use I'm going to use a an analogy because I'm a big everyone knows I'm a big Matrix fan, and um, I'm always you know thinking about uh, red pill blue pill moment. So if we think that you know we've taken the red pill. We we we've seen you know, uh, colorblindness and the law itself is producing this matrix in which um, uh, we've been given a frame of equality that we know has nothing to do with what our lived reality is. And critical race theory, you know, in some ways is Neo cutting it through and trying to show um, uh, the ways that um, the status quo is uh, presented uh, other than what it actually is, and law plays a, sig a significant role in that. So, so, so we, we've got the critique, we, we've, we've got the, the ways of showing, but at the end of the day, as Chuck says, it's not simply a matter of having a good line, uh, not simply a matter of having creative you know, ways of approaching the problem. At the end of the day, um, there's coercion, there's power, there's the state. Um, and I remember I was blown away in the last uh, iteration of Matrix because it turns out there were many neos who made it to that moment of encounter, and then there and then there was the question, what's going to be different this time, right? So from from an earlier uh, generative moment of critical race theory, as you ponder what's happening now, um, are are there ways in which we're replaying the the, the, the you know sort of the same dynamic? Um, are there lessons that you think can carry over to this moment that need to be interrogated? Um, or, or, or we just, you know, um, uh, kind of sitting it out to, to, you know, going with it with all the commitment, but not having a sense of what we can do differently this time. Unmute myself first. <laughs> yes. I've been talking about uh, critical thought being muted, and so I need to unmute myself <laughs> first. Um, I think, you know, in some respects, Kim, it there is a certain kind of iterative or recurring set of contradictions that come up in the context of working against, as I would call it, a kind of edifice of all of the things that TL just named and of all of the things that we've been naming. And when you think about um, it in terms of the long durée, right? Um, what does it mean, for example, for an enslaved person to think that they can come to a court of law mm -hmm. and get any kind of relief? Is that, is that some kind of psychosis or some kind of investment? Uh, what does it really mean? And I think, um, 
I, I start with that to basically because what I think we have always occupied with reference to law is that space that you described where it is revealed to us what its underlying structures are. Um, and yet we, we, we still, um, I think as you put it at the beginning, there is no sort of outside of it. Um, partly I think where, where I am with this is recognizing that it is a field of contestation and struggle and it is not one which I am willing to yield. In other words, it is not one in which I'm willing to say, y'all go ahead and do what you will. Because I realize that exactly what that means is ceding, ceding to my oppression. By the same token, I am not of the view that, um, you know, Audre Lorde taught us this many, many years ago, that this is going to actually be the tool of liberation. From my vantage point though, it is important to understand the apparatus and operation of state power. And if there is any, um, and I recognize that we are within a debate as Anna uh, alluded to, and to some extent is actually the undercurrent of some of what TL is talking about, which is questioning the, the, the possibility of whether or not state power can ever be exercised in a just and responsible way, or whether or not we actually have to even rethink that concept altogether, right? What does abolitionism mean taken all the way to the edge? But I think that in this particular moment, when we have um, our communities in such distress and crying out for whatever relief can be given, as well as bravely taking on board their own emancipation, um, meaning not waiting for um, somebody to show up and rescue them. We never have done that. Because had we done that, none of us would be sitting here now. Had mm -hmm. we been waiting on somebody to come and rescue us. <laughs> um, so I, I think that just trying to live with and uh, live with that uh, seemingly conflicted space and constantly looking for the places of opening and contradiction and pressure. To me, that is what actually law allows us to see better, to, to see where they are. Um, you know, this moment that we, you know, just to return to a moment to January 6th is a moment where the contradiction is very visible. It is, as you've talked about, produced a kind of um, crisis in which uh, there's a mantra about this is who we are. We know that's not true, or this is not who we are. Mm -hmm. We know that it, that actually is not true. This is who the United States is. And now um, the question is whether or not that reveal can generate and further animate the kinds of resistance and um, different kinds of thinking that I think we, in an earlier point, uh, and at a different historical moment, we're seeking to mobilize against the notion that somehow we were in a space where we could, in fact, um, operate outside of law. That's like thinking that we can operate outside of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I, 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 at, at this particular juncture, I think what we have to do is figure out how we can intensify the recognition of both uh, the limits of the existing legal framework um, as well as the possibilities of thinking about where there is a liberatory opening. Um, I just got through, and I'll wind this up, but I just got through teaching um, the case of Somerset, um, the case in, in England where a uh, colonial uh, subject brings his enslaved uh, person to England and uh, the man being no fool runs away uh, <laughs> and is captured and uh, there's an attempt to sell him to the West Indies. There's a habeas corpus petition filed. And Lord Manfield said, no, you can't take him because there is no positive law of slavery in England. Mm -hmm. Now he never says, once you touch free soil, you're free. But that is exactly how enslaved people interpreted that decision. And basically when they could and where they could exploited it, not only in court, but in real life, mm -hmm. meaning they ran, mm -hmm. they fled, and they asserted the legality of their position 
based upon that principle. That's the principle that actually comes into play in Dred Scott, the principle that once you touch free soil, you're free. I'm giving this simply as an example of um, not so much the power of law, right? But the power of our interpretive authority in making law. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, and 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 and, um, and and thank you for reaffirming my sense that Neo continuously reinterprets um, the uh, the authority of law and redeploys it uh, for the the continuous demands uh, of liberation. Um, I frame this as an intergenerational moment, so I'm now I'll come to you with, with that as well. My Neo question. Um, so, um, in, in, in your, your framing of the contemporary moment and the activism, there is, um, uh, enthusiasm and, uh, uh, I think, um, energy behind the idea that this is an unprecedented moment. And so it's possibilities, uh, for thinking boldly for doing, um, and creating, um, uh, uh, amount to uh, 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 optimism uh, about possibilities also in the face of the fact that things could go either way at this moment. So um, talk to us, um, and, 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 I, and I, this will have to be some closing thoughts. Uh, what should we take with us about what the contemporary lessons are uh, that have animated so much uh, movement? What are the contemporary lessons around um, uh, finding liberatory possibilities uh, within or through critical uh, framings of the law. Yeah, I mean, am I on? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And you're oh. you're coming you're coming last, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> you have pride of place being the OG <laughs> in the house. <laughs> so quickly, I guess two things. One is. My own sense of it is part of the reason why contemporary social movements have been more reluctant to push on the rights front. And they haven't, it's, it hasn't, well, there, ha there are places like, so for example, in New York, um, there's been a push by the housing justice movement to fight private capital through fighting for a right to counsel and housing court as part of a larger kind of effort to fight um, gentrification and commodification of housing in New York City. So there are exceptions, but I think one of the primary reasons why there's been a, a reluctance around fighting for rights in contemporary progressive social movements is in part because, um, you know, is basically because of mass criminalization, right? Because the central part of the, you know, like the Warren Court Revolution, for example, is the criminal procedure rights. And as those rights are kind of articulated in stronger force. Um, at the same time, uh, the civil rights movement and the broader new left is being crushed through COINTELPRO and other things. And um, so the power of the left of racial justice organizing and social movements is shrinking um, because you know there are active social forces fighting its power. Um, and so you have then that rights revolution, when we look back on it now, one of the main things it does is creates a scaffolding for the extension and the deepening of mass criminalization because now we have rights attached to it. People have lawyers, and so um, you know it's a way that the that the legalism kind of projects a um, uh, uh, you know like a neutrality and a propriety for that exercise of power. Okay, so and then the second thing I just wanted to say in terms of what how how and you know people should be um, thinking about this or showing up is I really think. Um, you know, these conversations are so important and, um, you know, we should all be having these conversations as faculty and lawyers and law students um, within the context of social movement organizations. Um, I think we should be building and joining organizations committed to kind of this dialectic between study and struggle in service of broader transformation, um, building modes of relating and building alternatives, making demands that challenge the very premise of everything and advance collective survival 
Um, and if you're on ca a campus anywhere, there are campaigns to divest from and break contracts with police. Um, there are graduate student and student unions that are fighting the terms of their employment. Um, there are staff that are, um, you know, whose uh, ability to survive and uh, make an income and a wage um, are in jeopardy right now. And so I think there's a lot of, I think the really important, one really important question I think um, is how struggles on campuses can be linked to the broader struggles that are happening in the cities in which our campuses are. And we can build broader kind of solidarity um, across and through student and um, campus fights. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for that, Amnan. You know, on that on that note, I want to you know kind of come full circle about uh, universities as as sites of struggle um, with just two 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 thoughts. Number one, you know, the the struggle to integrate to find space to redeploy the resources um, of of higher education, knowledge producing industries. Um, was was has been and continues to be a pitched struggle. Um, at earlier points, it was a bloody struggle. Um, uh, racial power is in many ways uh, constituted, rationalized, legitimized in these institutions that we are in. So they are as important um, as as the law itself, as arenas. You know of struggle, and it's that reason why it, it's not surprising at all that the ultimate objective of the executive order has been to try to suppress the production uh, of knowledge around structures uh, of inequality. I'm not surprised at all that the university is a site. It is the only institution um, out of which the majority of 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 uh, voters who are white voters who are not part of Trump's coalition have come out of. So it's pretty clear um, that this would be a, a, a site uh, of struggle. Um, but at the same time, it is struggle, right? And it is struggle with colleagues and it is struggle, you know, with institutions. You know, Chuck, I, I, I was mindful of the fact that Stanford was one of the first uh, institutions to sign on to uh, the executive order, even though it was an institution that produced some of the knowledge that um, is being suppressed by that. So that contradiction is always there. Um, so I'm I'm going to turn to you for for the last word. Um, uh, uh, you've said before um, that reconstruction requires transformative law, um, although history teaches us that reform efforts have often merely modified systems of racial and social control. So, you know, as the, as the old head uh, in the group, um, what do you leave us with as we think about, you know, as Cheryl said, the iterative process of this. So here we are coming around again, you know, in this moment, what do you want to lift up? What do you think we, um, the prior generation's lessons are um, that can be passed on or the ways that we can look at what we're seeing now um, through a new lens or a new prism moving forward? Yeah, Kim, I think um, uh, what I have to offer, the main thing I have to offer is what I'm feeling now, particularly listening to Ama and TL, um, when you talk about sort of the intergenerational thing and how it's a continuing struggle and, and the production of knowledge and this relationship to rights, that um, I'm both, you know, it's just so exciting to me um, to be on a panel, to hear, to be in conversation with bright, committed young people who are able to see these connections in the larger picture precisely because um, of their impatience with, you know, this. And I, I'm just, I'm reminded of, you know, before I came into teaching and in between, you know, when I graduated from law school and I went into a public interest practice, uh, I, I left and ran a black community school for three years and did organizing in Roxbury because I was just 
you know, you know, what's what the hell does the law have to do with any of this? I'm, you know, that the real site of contestation um, was uh, teaching ourselves um, that these structures needed to be um, fought against. And it was at a time which like this time, which I feel has come around, you know, it was uh, the late sixties and we were at the height of uh, as particularly as a black community, but even in the larger community in the context of the left and the, and the Vietnam war, uh, when, uh, when we were uh, very aware of the, the kinds of interrelationships that TL talks about, that we were all being oppressed by these various ways in which we were deemed not capable of governing ourselves. You know, that was, that was sort of the ideological thing behind, you know, that's still there, you know, that the state imposes this on us by its violence, but our our ability to recreate something new to do the real reconstruction has to understand that um, that that the real transformation uh, that new laws, as 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 you quoted me, is saying you know new laws always uh, when the state imposes them, they just recreate the oppression, right? And then you're back at it again. So you have to understand that ultimately we have to be able to uh, to come up with these new formations, and that and that in the process um, uh, in the process of resistance, we always have to thinking about what we're learning about ourselves and what we're learning about new ways of thinking, larger ways of thinking about all these things. So I think that. Um, you know, in my own mind, when you talk about the university as a site of knowledge production, what I've always tried to do with students is say, is, is find the young people like this and say, um, don't let this, this struggle to, to try to reframe, you know, to do what Cheryl was talking about, which is important to say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna see this area of contestation. As you say, Kimberly, this is the place, one of the sites of knowledge production. This is a, a narrative producing place, which just as the courts are, you know, each of these places, is framing what we're supposed to, is telling us a story about what we can fight for, what we can't fight for, what we can own, what we cannot own, right? So, but unless, if, if we get caught in these places and don't keep telling young people, no, take this thing that you're feeling and come to this place and, you know, that critical thought is really about saying, I'm going to take this truth that I come here with to contest the oppressive truth, and I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to keep on jamming it, you know. And I think that this thing that Am is talking about is so important that that all of the best work that all of us have done as critical thinkers, right, is because we've continue to stay engaged with people who are in the, you know, who are engaged in the movement, you know, who are engaged in the struggle and trying to think through, like, here's the next step we're going to take, take, you know, not, not to think in the abstract about these things, but the abstract thinking is always only fed by our continual um, engagement with the people who are really um, up against it. You know, and uh, and and being there with them to say, um, you know, what's how do we take the concrete experience and understand it? You know, um, so I think that uh, it's not what's exciting to me about this time, even though it's a, it, as you say, it's the you know the the reason that we've got this repression 
is is that it is a backlash. It's just it's precisely because we've been moving forward. You know, it's precisely because of all of these movements that are so vital now. And it was the same reason that we got COINTELPRO. You know, it was the vitality of the movements at that time that brought on the repre repression, right? So we have to understand that and say, you know, so what that means is we don't start, you know, as, as Biden comes into office, we don't revert to saying like, how can we help with these new little reformations that are gonna recreate our oppression? We have to keep on with the same thing that brought on the backlash, right? And uh, keep on re recreating our own understandings of, you know, that, that abol abolition is not just about abol abolishing the old, it's abolishing that institutions with a vision of what the new institution would look like. A vision, as TL says, about you know, what, what would it mean to not have this constricted notion of, of able, you know, of, of who is capable of envisioning and governing themselves, you know, um, so that the, 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 the notion of self-determination uh, not just as individuals, but more so as a community, you know, how do we, how do we not only, we can only govern ourselves as a community when we can create, when we can imagine ourselves as a community, you know, mm. and, and so, so much of this contestation uh, in the law is this trying to rest restrict our ability to imagine new ways of, of community. And that happens in the movement, you know, in the process of just trying to do the thing of survive and fight against. That's what creates the imagination of new ways, the struggling against the old. And, 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 and that's exactly why, you know, they're attacking critical race theorists and attacking people that are doing this history. Um, and they wouldn't be attacking us if we were just writing stuff that was, you know, what most academics do, sit in our office and think alone. They're only attacking you, Kimberly, because you're engaged with those women, those trans people, all of those people who are right up there, you know, being, uh, suffering these harms and recognizing that you are too. You know, that's why, that's why that thinking is being attacked. That's why that information is being suppressed. So um, my, you know, I just think we have to keep on with the same thing that we have to keep on saying that uh, what we what I felt then, you know, um, I'm coming here, you know, you guys need to start listening to folks who are, in, you know, I want to just stay engaged with these folks, you know, uh, that that's uh, that as um, uh, you know, I just retired, and you know, it's one thing, and 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 I am, you know, I'm I'm 77 years old. I have a right to retire, but I, what I miss is um, that I'm glad you're pulling me back to is this, you know, if when I listen to TL and Ama and all of these folks, you know, um, I I did a session with Elisa Garza the other day on, on Zoom as a part of a thing that she was coming out to do here. And it was just a conversation. I said, you know, this is what I miss. You know, I don't, you know, I hate faculty meetings. I hate, you know, <laughs> having to teach the Commerce Clause and all of that, you know, yeah. but, um, but uh, this is what is, is keeping us alive, you know, yes. um, that yes. this engagement with the movement. And what a beautiful note to end on, uh, Chuck. Thank you, you know, so much uh, for your thoughts and, well, and your leadership you over you. so many uh, of the years. Um, so many thanks to, to do right now. I'll, I'll try to, to make them quick. Uh, thanks to the UCLA Law Review and to Sunita Patel for inviting me to moderate this incredibly important conversation. And I really wanna thank our extraordinary panelists for their knowledge and their incredible good spirit. It was such an honor to speak with Amna, Cheryl, Chuck, and TL. 
they illuminated the world and the world role of critical race theory in transforming understandings of the law, how it can play uh, out in engaging this move, this moment. Um, as I said at the beginning, this has been an extraordinary year of twin pandemics of COVID and white supremacy. They've raised for us the structural and social dimensions of power. The title of this panel, Framing What Grounds Us, Structural Inequality, Social Movements in the Law, it is a call to action. And we are in a better position to do so with important conversations like these. And as Chuck just made clear, the future of social justice turns on our capacity to elevate the structural, intersectional, and cross-generational visions of social hierarchy and resistance to remake advocacy into a vision that is attentive to all of these things. Our next panel conversation is titled Rethinking Public Safety, Taking Structural Inequality Seriously. It will begin at 12 PST after a short break. My dear friend and colleague, brother Devin Carbato will be joined by Asagi Obasaji, uh, Peyton Provenzano, Sunita Patel and Kiara Bridges and Jeff Fagan. So please stay tuned for the rest of today's events. I look forward to seeing all of you at the end of the day. Thanks everybody. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for taking a short break with us and thank you for rejoining us today. I'd like to introduce our next moderator for our second panel today. Um, I'm especially happy to um, introduce this presenter, um, my critical race theory professor, Devin Carbato. Uh, professor Carbato is the Honorable Harry Priggerson Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. He's also the former Associate Vice Chancellor of Bruin X for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I also just want to make one more note. For those needing American Sign Language, we will have two interpreters, ASL interpreters, rotating during the sessions. Since this is a webinar, you will not need to pin the interpreters. They will appear alongside the speakers. You also have closed captioning options um, below on the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. You can click the CC icon. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And here's Professor Devin Carbato. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you and your uh, classmates for all the visioning and organizational work that went into realizing this particular moment. And I want to thank as well our uh, faculty lead for this project, that is to say, Sunita Patel. Um, who's a relatively junior member of this uh, faculty that she expended her time, effort and energy in this way, speaks volumes about her commitment to anti-racism and her vision of racial justice. So the title of this particular session, as I think you all know, is Rethinking Public Safety taking structural inequality seriously. And we've titled the session in that way precisely because we mean to rethink public safety uh, and take structural inequality seriously. But my surmise is that you're hoping that I might say something more specific about the terrain we mean to cover in this particular moment, other than merely re-articulating the title of the session. So indulge me as I do just that. I promise you that what I will say will be nothing, nothing in the way of a spoiler alert because our panelists are far too brilliant for that. Consider it a little bit of a heads up about uh, the terrain we mean to cover on this uh, particular panel. So we might begin by saying that uh, part of the aim in a way is to interrogate the assumption that policing specifically and car seriality generally are necessary to ensure public safety. Part of the aim is to push the boundaries of what we might mean by public safety. That is to say, to think critically and carefully about what counts as public safety and what does not. Part of the aim is to explore whether discourses about public safety inevitably function as legitimizing rhetorical devices through which to wield particular forms of state power, including the power to kill. Part of the aim, it seems to me, is to ask public safety for which communities, public safety from which communities, Part of the aim is to explicitly and intentionally racialize how we think about public safety, a racialization that in some ways takes us back to that moment of insurrection, a moment in which whiteness and lawlessness created a kind of law enforcement cognitive dissonance, and that law enforcement cognitive dissonance produced a particular kind of herd immunity, wherein white expressions of lawlessness managed to escape the kind of law enforcement discipline and law enforcement violence to which Black expressions of lawfulness is routinely subjected. Part of the aim is to infuse the debate about public safety with an intersectional sensibility. And I don't just mean that in an identitarian sense, though that clearly is important as well. I mean it in the sense of troubling default dichotomies, the dichotomy between public safety and public health, the dichotomy between public policing and private surveillance, and the dichotomy between the physical spaces of cost to reality on the one hand, and ideas and discursive frames that build those spaces one articulation at a time. And finally, part of the aim is to ask a question about whether racism itself stands in the way 
of realizing public safety in as much as racism creates multiple trajectories to violence, multiple trajectories to domination, multiple trajectories to exploitation, multiple trajectories to dehumanization, and multiple trajectories to premature death. I think what I'm trying to suggest is that part of our aim is to pursue multiple aims, and we have an absolutely terrific uh, uh, panel that will help us do that. Consistent with our overarching approach of the day, I'm not going to articulate bios, they'll be in the chat, you can figure out who people are and the nature of their work. I'm going to, in a very summary way, just name who the speakers are, uh, say a word or two about the terrain that they mean to cover and articulate the order in which we will proceed. We'll begin with uh, Sunita Patel, who, as we've suggested, is an assistant professor of law here at the law school and whose work is at the intersection of uh, lawyering and social movement. The particular presentation she'll offer today is an intersectional one, looking at policing, public safety, and public health uh, in a very specific context. That is to say, VA policing of veterans inside and outside uh, the context of the VA hospital. Then we'll move on to uh, Kiara uh, Bridges, who is a professor of law at Berkeley School of Law. Uh, her project will expand how we typically think about questions of public safety and raise a provocative question about whether debates about abortion should be understood as uh, debates that profoundly implicate concerns about um, public safety. Then we'll ask uh, Jeff Fagan to weigh in. Uh, he is a professor of law at Columbia Law School and does work on race, criminal justice, and empiricism. And he will seek to demonstrate that far from realizing public safety benefits, public safety discourses have a way of producing racially subordinating effects. And last but not least, uh, we'll um, turn to Osagi, uh, Obosogi, who is a professor of public health at Berkeley, and uh, Peyton Provenzano, who is a joint uh, degree student in uh, law and, um, uh, and uh, jurisprudence at uh, Berkeley School of Law as well. And their presentation in a way will say, we've heard an awful lot up until now about public safety, about racism and the ways in which uh, they're co-constitutive. Nevertheless, in the field of criminology, um, scholars have taken up the question of public safety, taken up the question of police violence, but put to one side questions of racism and uh, a race. Why might that be the case? So that's roughly the terrain we mean to cover. Each speaker will speak for something like uh, 13 or so minutes, and then we will open up space uh, for you to ask your questions. I've been very, very, very clear uh, to Ryan at the outset that I'm technological challenged. So if I have difficulty capturing your questions, uh, we will get some intervention so that my technological um, inabilities do not interrupt uh, the possibility to hear from you. And we really want to hear from you, even though this feels like it's a little bit one directional. So I'm going to shut up uh, now and turn things over to uh, Sunita Patel. So Sunita, uh, carry on. I want to begin by again, thanking the symposium organizers and co-sponsors. I also wanna thank my friend and colleague, Professor Devin Car Carbato for moderating our panel today. In the time that I have, I'm gonna talk about hospitals as carceral spaces. Um, so let me try to do my screen share here. Okay, I think that's working now. We're at a moment where we see a consciousness around the vast. So in the time I have, I'm gonna talk about hospitals as carceral spaces. We're in a moment where we see a consciousness around the vast reach of policing in many institutions. Advocates and social movements press us to examine all the locations where policing extends, schools, parks, public housing, transit, and the list goes on. Campaigns like Care Not Cages or Counselors Not Police enlist local governments to reprioritize public spending from policing to social institutions in an, alter in an alternative vision 
of what truly keeps us safe. But what if the counselors and care spaces are carceral? What if our hospitals and care workers like social workers, nurses, and doctors have adopted punitive logics? Let me tell you a story about a client of mine through the UCLA Veterans Legal Clinic. We'll call him Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford is a black man from North Carolina who uh, was enlisted in the Vietnam War. Mr. Ford's word, in his words, he experienced serious mental illness in the military. When I met him in 2017, he had been unhoused, sleeping in his car or on the street for almost 20 or 25 years. For some of that period, he was in jail or prison. Initially, our students were working with him to fix a problem with his veterans benefits or entitlements because of his military service. At some point, Mr. Ford mentioned that he didn't like to go to the hospital, to the veterans hospital. He gave the clinic students two reasons. First, once he was, he says wrongly arrested while visiting a VA hospital in Florida, when he was having a, in his words again, mental health episode. And as a consequence of that arrest, he served four years in Florida prison. Because of that experience, going to the hospital reminded him of the VA counselor who, who, in his words, lied to the police in the subsequent violent arrest by what was called VA police and so on. The second reason Mr. Ford did not like to go to the VA hospital was because whenever he went to the hospital, he was required to check in with the police and sometimes they followed him around. He told my students that his electronic medical records were flagged with big red letters disruptive to let any VA hospital worker know about his prior incidents. He felt people were biased against him and they might arrest him again if he was unwell, referring to his mental health distress. So let me set the stage. Here I was, only a few years after litigating an historic stop and frisk case in New York City, and I'm totally surprised to learn about the experience of my client. Mr. Flo Ford led me to the discovery of the largest police department within the largest healthcare setting in the country, the Veterans Affairs Police Force. So of course this meant the work of, my work with veterans would be more than public benefits and housing assistance. We partnered with an organization of black veterans, the National Association of Minority Veterans, who works to end racial bias in the VA and has been long pressing the issue of policing. We did this deep dive into the congressional record, hearings, Federal Register and audits and reports about VA police and its security. And I was surprised to learn that the Veterans Affairs Agency included a full-fledged militarized police force. I was surprised to find a law enforcement agency embedded within a comprehensive public health care system designed to serve the most, some of the most marginalized and forgotten clients I've ever represented. But perhaps I shouldn't have been. For poor, non white, disabled, and otherwise non normative persons, healthcare spacers become coercive and sometimes violent. This is the underbelly of care work. Intersections of surveillance, reporting requirements, and violence are enacted on the unruly bo bodies, to borrow the phrase from my co panelist, Kara Bridges, the unruly bodies of medically vulnerable patients in so many care settings. This set me on a path of looking into how institutions whose primary function is to dispense care become sites for rather than sites free of the regulatory, disciplinary, and violent dimensions of policing. Half of private hospitals, it turns out, have their own police force. Almost all states increase sentencing for crimes on medical grounds. It turns out that even if we extract the police personnel or security guards from the police space, policing logics have distorted health systems in other ways. Inculcating police in care settings raises complicated questions around patient privacy, medical ethics, and even occupational safety, not only the Fourth Amendment. So let me take a step back. Only about half of veterans use VA medical services. VA medical centers primarily serve the underinsured and uninsured. 
and, most, and the most vulnerable veterans. Multiple studies conclude the predictors of VHA use are disabil disabilities, including post-traumatic stress disorder su or substance use as a result of service. Race, poverty. Women use v VA services at a higher rate than men, with one in four women as survivors of military sexual trauma. And transgender veterans are also high utilizers of VHA services. And when I say VHA, I mean the Veterans Healthcare Administration. So this community faces the compounding effects of war trauma, poverty prior to enlistment or the draft, and social conditions like homelessness and incarceration when returning from wartime service. And for people who don't know much about the VA, let me signal that the agency is actually multiple systems in one institution. The VA is a care space. The healthcare is the closest thing in this country we have to social medicine. Um, it's a workplace. I'll talk about that more in a second. It provides public assistance and social welfare, peer support. There's a self-help infrastructure. It operates veteran-centered suicide hotlines. Um, it also provides low-income housing. Low barrier and harm reduction op options are available for veterans that are in recovery. It's also a vocational training and job support location. So maybe you can see now why I was surprised. I imagined the VA to be this utopic sanctuary. Instead, veterans like Mr. Ford, who needed the most care and support, were surveilled and punished. They are seen as perpetual threats. Carceral logics have taken hold, even though this institution should be a space free of harm, racial bias, and criminalization. So we have this robust social system. Then around 1970, Congress heard reports of crime and harm against patients, as well as anti-war protests on VA property, because you can imagine what was happening in the world. We know what was happening in the country around that time. Congress held some hearings and decided in 1973 to establish the Veterans Affairs Police Force as an embedded law enforcement agency within its medical system, med the medical care system. Its role was essentially to manage and control veterans returning from wo the war in Vietnam with a host of complex medical and mental health needs. Despite the hospital environment, Given the disabled, non-white, traumatized subjects of the police force, we can predict the developments from 1973 to now. You can read more about that in the paper, um, uh, but just suffice it to say that they, there's expanded authority, more weaponization, and an, even an infusion into the national security apparatus, and I explain all that in the paper. Um, today, Congress has appropriated funding for 4,800 police officers to operate within 1,200 healthcare facilities and clinics. That means they police 9 million patients and almost 400,000 employees. These uniformed hospital police officers carry guns, they have access to FBI databases, and millions of dollars in military-grade equipment. So looking closely at the VA, we can see its imbrication with carceral logics beyond police and criminal enforcement. It's not only a problem of police personnel or arrests, as the Ford example shows, care workers and hospital staff are transformed into pseudo police, through multiple crime and workplace safety systems and regulations. And the VA is just an example of what happens in other public hospitals in poor neighborhoods. So I'm thinking through how this hospital policing operates as what I'm calling a web that wraps itself around veterans, care spaces, and its workers, um, as well as veterans in the community, meaning their homes, their shelters, or their encampments. So my web has three levels, um, and I'm kind of playing around with this idea, so I, I welcome other, the feedback from my co-panelists. So the first level is the central part, the internal governance structure. Um, the second is the safety, is safety regulatory schemes and legal requirements. And the third is veterans policing in the community. I'm gonna focus on the two inner uh, rings because I think that's where I can provide the newest insights um, for purposes of this presentation. 
So going back to the center portion, let me say to let me say um, that these two inner rings were set up to give the VA a way to provide treatment to patients who in other situations might be dismissed from care um, because of violent or threatening behavior. So you take note of systems ostensibly for the safety of workers. So this internal governance structure um, is named a disruptive behavior committee and it's designed to uh, manage, as the name says, disruptive behavior through three systems that overlap red flags, orders, and cr criminal enforcement. So the red flags are literally the red flags that Mr. Ford mentioned um, that are in his electronic medical record. You know, as his example shows, they can create stigma for um, patients and also enact bias if someone sees this um, and that this is the first interaction they're having with someone. So, and it's also very subjective enforcement, right? So the best data that I've been able to find show from the Office of Inspector General of the VA um, says that 56% of the referrals to this committee were for verbal aggression, 20% were for drug seeking behavior, and another 20% were for a category called other, which um, the report says is complaining about wait times and speaking loudly. So next, um, you know, there's these orders that are like, this is what requires alter, alterations in the provision of, of care. 35% of the veterans are like Mr. Ford, required to check in with police or have police escort them while obtaining treatment. And this committee um, utilizes criminal regulatory charges that can lead to, that lead to federal, federal misdemeanors. Um, and so those carry, you know, hundreds of dollars in fines and up to six months in, in jail. Um, so I'm calling this a carceral web not only because it surveils and criminalizes veterans, but also because it imbricates police as part of the clip, this governance structure, which are in, meant to, designed to be part of a clinical health decision process. So the police force is required to be a member of this um, committee. The police help to draft the policy that defines disruptive conduct and then enacts the policy on the bodies of veterans seeking care throughout the three levels. So this brings me to the second level, um, policing logics that have become part of workplace safety regulatory schemes. In the VA, um, workers are required to engage in threat assessments around the risk of harm by their patients. They engage in security trainings and they are required to report certain events and incidents. So in the example of Mr. Ford, healthcare workers are re were required to call the police. Um, they're acting, and in other situations, they're acting as security. They're adopting a police framework, often not of their own will, but because there is some requirement, right? So let me back up and say, I'm not saying that care workers should be subjected to violence by patients. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a serious issue. We should, we should take this seriously. And I believe in harm-free and safe workplaces. The system should use, should use police as a very last resort, if at all. Um, and the studies indicate healthcare workers are divided on whether and when to utilize formal police responses, but sometimes feel their hands are tied. And there's, a, there's always the question of effectiveness. So the limited studies I've seen on these two circles, these two inner rings, they, sh they question whether this is actually effective at reducing workplace violence in the healthcare setting. And then what about the patient and doctor relationship? Embedding police in, a care, work, in care work distorts care decisions disrupts trust. Um, and so the carceral logics here produce punitive and biased responses to the black, disabled, unhoused, and otherwise marginalized veterans. Now, I'm about to wrap up. Um, I've criticized the implication of carceral logics in the VA's healthcare system. And I wanna say that the doctors, social workers, and other staff that I've worked with have gone above and beyond for their patients. They care about their veteran patients. Um, and so my criticism of the utilization of the police force and its extension to care workers is with the objective of reframing our responses to harm. We need to think of ways to care for veterans and care for the workers without relying on policing and carcerality. So um, acknowledging carcerality of medical institutions leads to complex questions in need of complex solutions. You can read my paper to hear more about my suggestions, but the bottom line is 
adopting an abolitionist framework requires us to do more than re remove police from care spaces. It would require thinking the these all these levels um, of what my article calls the hospital to policing web. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, oh, how do I do that? Um, maybe I can be unpinned. Um, one and I can, oh, here we go, stop sharing. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to the comments and suggestions. Uh, thank you. Um, and, you know, a part, part of the implication of the paper, uh, which I'm hoping people have an opportunity to read, is uh, it's in conversation with other uh, discourses that suggest that the uh, argument around pipelines, too, while useful as a start of as a starting point obscure that uh, it's not the case that the carceral site is over there and people are moving to it. It's rather the case as well that carceral sites are in places that we don't necessarily understand to be such, schools being one and hospitals uh, along the lines that you're suggesting uh, being another. Uh, so to help us further broaden the frame before we come back to um, the quintessential way in which we sometimes engage in debates about uh, public safety. I want to ask uh, Kiara Bridges uh, to jump in uh, and explain to us why it might make sense to employ um, abortion as a context within which to have a debate about uh, public safety. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. And also thank you to the organizers of today's symposium, my co-panelists, and of course, the folks who are tuning in right now, um, engaging with us. Um, so I'm going to begin to share my screen um, and I will give you a couple, 15, a 13 minute talk about um, a paper that I've written called Deploying Death. Um, so the term public safety traditionally refers to matters involving crime and violence. And thus public safety typically identifies matters to which in the first instance, police officers and police departments respond. Now in my remarks today, I wanna to push the boundaries of the term public safety so that it is expansive enough to accommodate a subject that we tend to categorize as an issue of public health. And that subject is abortion. Now, there will be some who find it awkward to conceptualize abortion as an issue of public safety. However, I do not find the public safety framing of abortion to be clumsy at all. This is simply because the traditional primary agents of public safety, that is the police, already do so much public health work. We need to look no further than the arrests of people who have failed to wear a mask during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic a tried and true public health crisis. We can, almost, we can also look to the numerous people who were suffering from a mental health crisis when the police killed them. Their deaths attest to the fact that the country lacks a public health infrastructure that can provide health care to those in acute moments of need. The police, public safety actors, have come to fill this void in public health. Which is to say, the fact that the nation has elected to rely on police officers, prosecutors, and correctional institutions to address all of its social problems has made the line that purports to divide public health and public safety exceptionally flimsy. And so the benefits of defending that line being uncertain, I'm going to go ahead and ignore it. <laughs> so I'm interested in, answer, in asking the question, what if the doomsday predictions are right and the court overturns Roe? What does a world after Roe look like? It is likely that a post-Roe world will look quite similar to a pre-Roe world. That is, in a post-Roe world, wealthier people will be able to safely, albeit illegally, terminate unwanted pregnancies. Meanwhile, those without class privilege will be forced either to carry unwanted pregnancies to term or to undergo abortions in conditions that are more likely to be unsafe. Historian David Garrow writes that in the days before Roe, there were hundreds upon hundreds of doctors in the country who secretly performed abortions for women whom they knew and who could pay. Yet these doctors remained out of the reach of poor people. Poor folks did not have the social connections that would allow them to find the doctors who were willing to perform abortion procedures despite the prescription of law. 
And even if poor people could locate these practitioners, they cannot afford to pay the doctors for their services. The racial geography of this state of affairs is predictable. The affluent people with abortion access were disproportionately white and the low income people who were forced into motherhood or who risked their lives in the attempt to avoid the same were disproportionately non-white. And so in a post row world, we should expect that people with class privilege, a group that in this country disproportionately enjoys race privilege, they will be able to access safe, if not always legal abortion care. Meanwhile, their unprivileged counterparts will find such health care to be a luxury that they simply cannot afford. It is also quite possible that a post row world will, look, will not look appreciably different from our present. Currently, the Constitution protects the right to terminate a pregnancy, yes. However, for those without class privilege, this is only nominally true. For the marginalized, the abortion right currently exists in theory alone. This is due to three factors that I will mention here. The first is the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits federal funds from being used to cover the cost of abortion care. The Hyde Amendment means that low-income Medicaid-reliant people, as well as people who rely on Indian health services for their care, cannot use their health insurance and their health care providers for abortion care. The second is the fact that the court upheld the constitutionality of waiting periods in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Because waiting periods require an individual to make at least two trips to an abortion provider, they have the effect of making abortion more expensive. Two trips mean that an individual has to buy twice as much gas. She may have to pay for a hotel room in a city close to an abortion clinic if driving back and forth from her home is not tenable. She may have to take days off from work. She may have to pay for childcare for an additional night. More affluent people will be able to absorb these costs low income people frequently find them insurmountable. And finally, there are no abortion providers in many parts of the country. Amnesty International reports that in 2019, six states had only one abortion provider. Further, 27 major US cities and much of rural America qualify as abortion deserts, where most people live more than 100 miles away from an abortion provider. The fact that there are no abortion providers in many parts of the country has the effect of making abortion more expensive as people have to travel longer distances and incur um, all of the financial and practical costs associated with trekking hundreds of miles for healthcare. So although many are stealing themselves for a post row world, we may be living some version of the future right now. If we examine what abortion rights look like on the ground, we see that the reversal of Roe would not be like turning off a light switch. If Roe falls, it will not be a dramatic moment that shifts the nation from a country in which anyone who wants an abortion can get one to a country in which no one who wants an abortion can get one. Instead, the lights have been dimming for quite some time. The reversal of Roe simply will usher more people into a darkness of abortion inaccessibility that already enshrouds the most marginalized. If Roe is overturned and states are permitted to criminalize abortion, it seems unexceptionable to conclude that more people will be forced to carry pregnancies to term. It also seems unexceptionable to conclude that if Roe is overturned and states are permitted to criminalize abortion, more people will terminate pregnancies illegally. Of these pregnancy terminations that are prescribed by law, some will take place under safe conditions. However, other pregnancy terminations in a post rural world Will, look, will not take place under safe conditions. Some people will allow those who are untrained and unprincipled to perform abortions on them. That is, the back alley abortions of the past will reemerge. Others will attempt to end unwanted pregnancies by in introducing dangerous foreign objects into their vaginas, cervixes, and uteruses, like coat hangers, knitting needles, douches made of noxious liquids. Some will attempt to induce a miscarriage by ingesting toxic amounts of drugs, medications, or other substances. Others will try to terminate their pregnancies by subjecting themselves to blunt trauma. Indeed, there are a myriad ways in which a person can attempt to self-abort, which is a testament to the profundity of the desperation that people carrying an unwanted pregnancy feel. If history is a teacher, the poorest, most vulnerable people will comprise the population that attempts to terminate their pregnancies unsafely. 
Of those marginalized people who have abortions under unsafe conditions, some will emerge unscathed. Others, however, will suffer severe injuries like the perforated uteruses that lead to hysterectomies or the uncontrolled infections that culminate in sepsis. Some of the most severely injured will die. Indeed, it seems likely that the fall of Roe will lead to death. Abortion rights advocates have long centered this fight, this fact in their fight for abortion rights. They have always deployed death. Death is what the symbol of the coat hanger implies. Death is what is deployed when abortion protests take the form of die-ins. During these protests, activists mimic the dead, making visible and material the death that abortion restrictions cause. During Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing, Senator Ben Sass observed that protesters have always attended confirmation hearings to deploy death in the fight for abortion rights, interrupting proceedings to remind senators that, quote, women are going to die if Roe is overturned. I ask, in a post-Roe country, what will the actual political weight of abortion-related death be? Now, in posing this question, I am interested in the political significance of the race of those who will die. Presently, Black people disproportionately turn to abortion care. Nationally, the abortion rate of Black people is between two or three times the abortion rate of their white counterparts. There are many factors that contribute to Black people's over-reliance on, on abortion care. At its simplest, Black people want and need abortions more frequently than their non-Black counterparts because of structural racism. Structural racism has led to Black people disproportionately bearing the burdens of poverty. Poverty makes it difficult for people to access basic health care, including contraception. Moreover, the poverty in which Black people disproportionately live increases the, li increases the likelihood that when they encounter an unwanted pregnancy, they will not want to carry it to term. They won't be able to afford it. The higher frequency at which Black people use abortion services means that if Roe is overturned, Black people will be disproportionately affected. Black people more frequently will have to decide whether to carry an unwanted pregnancy to turn or to defy criminal laws and terminate it. Further, given Black people's well-documented marginalization, it seems quite likely that of those Black people who decide to terminate pregnancies despite criminal prescriptions, they will find safe abortion harder to obtain than their race and class privileged counterparts. Black people will be disproportionately those who attempt to induce miscarriages by throwing themselves down flights of stairs, inserting coat hangers into their uteruses, or ingesting toxins in order to poison the fetus that their body unwantedly sustains. Because Black people, too, due to their higher rates and degrees of marginalization, are more likely to attempt unsafe abortion in Rose Wake, we can expect that Black people will die more frequently than their race-privileged counterparts. And so the question about the political weight of death in the post roe era acquires some particularity. Specifically, the question is about the political weight of the death of Black people. Even more specifically, the question is about the political weight of the death of Black women and Black people with the capacity for pregnancy. Abortion rights proponents who wield coat hangers perceive from the assumption that abortion-related death makes an argument that defeats a response. They assume that death is a signifier with only one signified. And so the deaths of those felled while attempting to terminate a pregnancy in a post row era inevitably will be deployed to make claims about the need to protect the right to access safe and legal abortion, whether it be through constitutional amendment or comprehensive federal legislation. But I think we have to pay attention to the race of those who will die abortion related deaths. Again, black people will disproportionately die if Roe falls. And there is nothing in this country's history and present that suggests that the race of those who will die will make observers more sympathetic to efforts to prevent such deaths. Indeed, there is much in this country's history and present that suggests that the race of those who will die will make it easier for observers to blame them for dying. The race of the dead will make it easy for observers to deny their humanity, to dismiss their deaths as an irrelevancy. I wonder if abortion rights supporters who currently deploy death, who wear no coat hanger pins on their shirts, who participate in die-ins, I wonder if they know this. I wonder if they know that the deployment of death in the abortion context is more convincing if it stays abstract, if it does not reference the actual bodies of those who will die. 
Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kiara. I have to say, uh, you know, hearing the presentation, it uh, strikes me um, as odd the point of departure in this sense. I mean, the account that you provide is utterly and completely compelling and one wonders why uh, abortion has not figured as a uh, public safety concern given the very structural inequality. I wanna mark the structural inequality um, way in which you framed it. And if I forget, just remind me, I, I, I'm interested in as well in the question of deploying death from a pro-rights perspective. That is to say, it's an argument about death that that might warrant the kind of restrictions of abortion uh, that we see. So death could be playing itself on both sides of the debate. So that's uh, something I hope you might help us think through uh, uh, later on. But I wanna invite um, Jeff Fagan into the conversation now. And in some ways this brings us into the kind of core space where concerns of public safety gets articulated. The notion that we need particular forms of policing in order to ensure public safety benefits. And uh, Jeff's uh, work in this area calls that assumption into question. So let me shut up and ask uh, Jeff uh, to weigh in. Thanks, Devin. And thanks to the organizers. It's a terrific uh, symposium and a terrific panel. So, and it's good to see my colleagues on the panel who I know and we're stuck seeing each other on video, but uh, one day soon we will be uh, seeing each other in person. Um, proactive policing is something that has occupied the policing space in cities large and small all over the country. Um, it has a very specific meaning uh, within the world of policing. The meaning is that everyone's under suspicion. Uh, there are um, low suspicion stops, whether on the highway or on the street. Uh, there are misdemeanor arrests or other sanctions, citations and the like. Uh, for even the most, um, the, the, the thinnest violations of uh, either administrative law or criminal law. Um, it's increased the rate of police contact with civilians. Most of these stops, the ones that aren't, aren't arrests, uh, produce nothing with respect to public safety. We've learned this from uh, studies all over the country. Um, reports from civilians <clears throat> tell us that these stops themselves are particularly noxious, um, toxic. Uh, they involve invasive searches. They involve, particularly for people of color, um, uh, just the most horrible racist rhetoric. Um, they involve violent language. They involve people being forced to the ground to lie on the streets, no matter what the weather or the conditions. Uh, these things happen in front of their neighbors, so there's some shaming or stigma, um, or just simply confirmation of the fact that this could be me and everybody seems to share their same fate, much in the sense that Michael Dawson talks about linked fate in his work. Um, the data from both civilian reports in the street, ethnographic work, people like Rob Brunson has done some fantastic work, others have done fantastic work in interviews, and administrative records pretty much confirm that this is the state of affairs. It's confined to the neighborhoods that are not just the most high crime neighborhoods, but they're also the neighborhoods that are the most economically and socially isolated and the most segregated. I've been writing about segregation and policing and uh, gonna be returning back to that so often because segregation is, in, is inextricably linked to the structural inequalities that are animating this conversation. Um, the burden of, the of these things, obviously, um, from everything we understand from data falls on people of color. Um, and often in the most economically, as I said, disadvantaged neighborhoods. So rather than, um, there's a lot of talk often about um, harm reduction. We wanna reduce the harm from a variety of bad policies. In our case, I think we wanna think about the possibility that these regimes are um, going to actually cause harm. So let me um, share my screen. I finally, after uh, three semesters of teaching, um, using, using um, uh, Zoom, I figured out how to do this. Um, okay, so um, let me start with five or six different areas where we've been able to identify empirically uh, how these harms take place. This first slide is a study um, of young men, teenagers ages 15 to 20 in 30 different cities across the country. And they were sampled by um, in a study called Fragile Families. Uh, meaning they come from neighborhoods where families are under stress economically, socially, um, where there are high rates of uh, child removal, incarceration, welfare dependence, and so on. So very simply, we surveyed them. We said, how do you feel about the police? Are you willing to cooperate with the police and help them in their investigations? We know now that there's something of, a, of an epidemic of violence. Um, we can interpret that violence in many different ways, 
uh, but going on in, in many cities in the country, mostly in the same neighborhoods where policing uh, up until recently has been the most concentrated. So the long and short of it is if you look at this slide, I've circled the places where, and I'm not gonna torture you with statistics any more than this, everything else will be graphs, I promise. Um, but if you look at these little asterisks up here, as we often do, um, people who are legally, cinema, legally cynical or estranged to use Monica Bell's term, um, are more often than not the result of frequent personal contacts. Um, it's only when you get to the last column when we, and this is something if you go down, if you look down uh, to the racial composition of the people in the samples, uh, it's mostly um, people who are black uh, Latinx people uh, or other race people. But for the most part, it's black and Latinx people. Um, so the more that they're treated badly, the more that they are legally estranged from the system. People wonder why can't the police do anything about this epidemic of shootings and stabbings and particularly shootings and homicides that are going on in the cities in, during the pandemic. It started long before the pandemic, but why can't they do, the, do something about it? And the answer is quite simple, um, because nobody will help the police because the police are oppressive uh, and they're engaged in a project of sub subjugation of communities. This is a study that we did in New York. We interviewed 1,250, 1,350 uh, young men between the ages of um, 18 and 27. And we asked them very simply, um, how often have you been stopped in the last year? Uh, and then we gave them some very standard psychological scales. One is about anxiety. The other is about um, PTSD, the same PTSD that afflicts first responders and hurricanes and, and, and earthquakes and floods and fires. Um, the same PTSD, PTSD that afflicts frontline medical responders and the same PTSD that afflicted soldiers in Vietnam and other war zones. Uh, we in fact use the same war zone scales to measure PTSD in these populations. And we asked them in the, the several months after the stop that was the most harmful to them, the one that they remember the most, we didn't qualify. We just said, which one stands out to you the most? And they told us, and if you look at the graph, you'll see the red lines, which kind of smooth out all those dots, basically go up. We, made, we created a scale of intrusion. Is there violence during the stop? Uh, was there harsh language, was there racist language? Uh, was the stop unnecessary? Uh, were you called names? Uh, uh, were your friends cast, uh, uh, fall under a cast of suspicion? And the more intrusive the stop, the greater the degree of harm that we saw there. Here's another project. This is done by a, a former colleague at the New York City Department of Health, who's uh, Abigail Sewell, who's a fantastic sociologist. She's now teaching at the University of Georgia. Um, and she did a similar kind of survey, but she was focused on health. So she surveyed people in all of the neighborhoods in New York. She looked at the stop frequency. So the, the scale on the, the, the axis of the x-axis is the frequency of stops. On the y-axis is the frequency of problems, four different kinds of health problems. And you can see that for diabetes, for obesity, and for high blood pressure, the greater the number of stops in the neighborhood, the greater the proportion of people stopped in those neighborhoods, the higher the rates of those, the incidence rates of those diseases. Um, and she drew the lines, the separate lines, that reflect different racial compositions of the neighborhoods where the stops took place. And so this is something that affects really acutely everybody, but the most, the most acute effects and the, most, the strongest effects are the ones that take place in uh, the neighborhoods where there are very high concentrations of people of color. This is a study that we did in New York where we looked at school test scores among uh, young adolescent males. Uh, we started tracking them or the school, we, we got their test scores in the schools. So we, we looked at their test scores starting at roughly the eighth grade and going through um, uh, their senior year in high school. And we asked them about um, their stop rates. We did it by neighborhood by neighborhood. We looked at the schools in neighborhoods, calculated the stop rates in the neighborhoods of people who were in their teenage years. And we asked, we looked at who was stopped by race and ethnicity. And lo and behold, um, the greater the ratio of stops um, in a neighborhood, the higher, the, the, the greater the depression of test scores following the, the most uh, critical stop. So the time here is um, the time for the test, controlling for how often, for what happened to that person in the period before the test. People who were stopped more often, African-American males, um, suffered the greatest amount of emotional disturbance. Um, this, is from, um, this is from Desmond Ang, who did this research in LA. So you all understand uh, this is very local. And he tracked people in their response to police shootings, if they happen to know within a mile of their home. And he looked at their test scores after the shooting. And you can see the depression on their test scores, um, both in their grade point average, but also then in a standard psychological measure of emotional disturbance. This is the one we did in New York with school test scores, pretty much the same kind of design. And you can see in the red circles, 
the depression for African-American kids in their reading scores and in their math scores, standardized test scores in the neighborhood. So it's directly correlated with the concentration of police stops in those neighborhoods. Um, what's really interesting is that it afflicts males more, than, males more than females. Females seem to be unaffected. This is a study, something that we have to interrogate. We don't really quite understand it. And it afflicts African-American males more than it did Latinx males. And we think the reason there is simply because of the demographics of where the stops take place. They are so heavily saturated into African-American neighborhoods in New York that, that the test scores here. So we see this as, as all of these things, if you go back up to the top, all of them are basically disabling. And they, in, they reinforce the structural inequality of people by mortgaging their future, their ability to do well once they enter into adulthood. So this is reinforcing structural inequality in a way that's particularly dangerous and particularly toxic. Um, this is, um, well, that's, that's the last one. I wanted to talk a little bit about segregation because these are the ways that we think segregation gets reinforced. If you are confined to a neighborhood because you don't have the capacity, the school test scores, the social capital and the human capital to get out of a tough neighborhood or to do well in the workplace, you are structurally confined in those neighborhoods. So we talk a lot about boundary maintenance. We talk a lot about policing as a way to reinforce boundaries and maintain those segregation boundaries. And they do it not just by physically um, intimidating people from uh, wandering outside the boundaries and, and sub subjugating them while they're inside their neighborhoods, but also because they disable them, they hobble them on their way to adulthood and to taking their place in society. Uh, we think that segregation, Monica's just written a wonderful piece about uh, what she calls anti-segregation policing. She's visiting with us this semester, so happy to talk about her work. Um, uh, but this is, I think, a very, very important um, understanding of the spatial effects and the confinement of people's moves, the hobbling of their development, and the limitations that are placed on their social capital and, and human capital, and their ability to escape from um, conditions of poverty. So uh, when we talk about harm, uh, when we talk about toxicity of policing with no visible return to public safety, then we need to talk in terms of very concrete measures such as these. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks uh, very much for that, Jeff. So just remember, we started with a conversation about uh, a policing web, a uh, healthcare policing web that uh, Sunita described, and it's a web that is structural, and it's a web that implicates race and racism quite clearly. We moved on to uh, Kiara's presentation, and in that context, she's told a story about public safety that implicates police officers enforcing uh, or, or, or carrying out their enforcement mission and the extent to which um, Black women in particular are vulnerable to death under particular kinds of um, um, abortion uh, regimes. Uh, that too is a story about race and racism. And then we landed with Jeff, who suggested that public safety policing in the form of, for example, proactive policing is a story about racial segregation, is a story about people's mental health being compromised, is a story about um, people's educational experiences being compromised, all of which mortgages their future, so to speak. So in all of these accounts of uh, public safety and policing, race and racism are centralized. The question becomes, uh, do we see the attention to race and racism in uh, the criminology uh, discourses? And uh, the answer to that question, spoiler alert a little bit is no, but uh, thankfully Osagi and Peyton will help us think about how that non-engagement comes into being. That is to say, what forms does it take and, and, and why is it there? So let me turn things over uh, to them. Great, uh, so thank you, Devin. And uh, thank you to the UCLA, UCLA Law Review for inviting us to be here. Uh, my name is Osagi Obasogi and I'm a professor uh, at Berkeley in the Joint Medical Program and the School of Public Health. I'll be presenting today with my colleague, Peyton Provenzano, who is a JD student at Berkeley Law and a PhD student in the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program at Berkeley. So Peyton and I are interested in the issue of structural inequality and in public safety as it relates to police use of force. Uh, in particular, we wanna try to understand how the field of criminology studies and thinks about the role of race and racism when police use, use force on community members. 
This is important because findings from social scientists in this field are often used to inform both police practices and public policy. Put differently, criminological research can have a direct impact on public safety in terms of whether policies regarding the use of force adequately take into consideration the experiences of racial minorities. So our project attempts to identify common trends in the literature on how published research in criminology has approached this issue. I'll now turn things over to Peyton to discuss our research methods and findings. Great, so just to echo the many thanks for the opportunity to share our work, I'm certainly humbled to be presenting alongside such distinguished scholars. Um, and so, uh, in this article, we ask um, what role have race and racism played um, in how the field of criminology has examined the police use of force. Our sample includes articles published in the top 10 criminology journals from 2000 to 2020. Um, we developed a qualitative coding scheme to understand the theoretical, methodological, and analytical tendencies within mainstream criminology. With respect to search terms, we tried to account for all of the ways in which criminologists talk about the police use of force. The final data set consists of 121 articles that included a substantive discussion on the police use of force. And now we'll transition to findings. So we found that the discourse of 21st century criminology fails to account for the relationship between racism and the police use of force in three ways. First, criminologists take an ahistorical approach to the study of police violence. Second, the theoretical underpinnings lend themselves to a description of the phenomena instead of an analysis of its significance in terms of against whom police violence is actualized. Finally, the methodological approaches are overwhelmingly quantitative and fail to capture the nuance, salience, and lived experience of police violence as it relates to racism. So our first finding is that criminologists tend to take an ahistorical approach by framing the scholarly interest in racialized police violence as emerging in the 1960s. On the one hand, locating the dawn of social scientific inquiry into the police use of force in the 1960s is absurd. On the other hand, it makes perfect sense. Locating the history of police use of force as beginning in the 1960s places the role of the police in settler colonialism, slavery, and segregation beyond the scope of inquiry. The work of W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and the Civil Rights Congress is evidently not seen as scholarly or legitimate. Because most studies take an ahistorical approach to the study of policing, they do not have the analytical tools to understand the racism that manifests in the disproportionate use of police force against people of color, especially against Black people in the United States. This literature sample illustrates an important fact. Racism is not a legitimate topic of study for criminologists. Out of the 15 articles that mention racism, only five discuss the significance of racism in relation to the findings. Rather, the tendency of mainstream criminology to use euphemisms to talk about anti-Black racism is a notable trend in the literature. For example, terminology like anti-Black prejudice frames the issue as an individual rather than as a structural problem. Ironically, Johnson and Hughes purport to be interested in the influence of two variables, perceived racial bias in policing and negative racial stereotyping. So in essence, the authors managed to conduct a study on racism without actually ever mentioning the term. And similar to the way in which historical analysis of the police is truncated in large part from the 1960s onward, so too are the theoretical underpinnings. Beginning with race and theories of place or context, the theory of the situationally, situationally justified use of force coined in 1970 remi remains foundational for 21st century criminologists. Because of the spatialization of race in the United States, place-based control variables dilute the salience of race as it relates to the police use of force. In effect, situational factors become a way to rationalize rather than to question police discretion. To continue, theories of behavior are used to frame the police use of force as reactionary. For example, one author contends that, quote, race does not imply the need to use force, behavior does. The author then goes on to contradict this claim by invoking tropes about Black criminality rooted in racist notions of hyper-masculinity. 
Very quickly, the conflation of race and behavior becomes a theoretical orientation rooted in minority threat theories, which brings me to the final theoretical category. Paradoxically, the use of race-centric theoretical orientations leads criminologists to discredit or altogether neglect the role of racism. For example, implicit bias raises important issues about how unconscious bias can structure police interactions, but we also need to consider the role of explicit bias, i.e. of racism. So consider the first part of this quote. Citing statistics from the Black Lives Matter movement, the author concludes, and I quote, that these statements imply that the police are overtly prejudiced towards minorities, which is certainly possible, but unlikely. Dismissing the possibility of explicit racism, the article goes on to claim that officers might be implicitly biased against minorities. And the issue here is that scholars are using implicit bias to foreclose a conversation on racism. More concerning is the manner in which theoretical derivatives of implicit bias have been produced and reproduced in the criminological literature. The notion of counter bias suggests that officers are more hesitant to use force against minorities. And this idea emerged from a set of empirical studies that tested the implicit bias of police officers in a use of force simulation device. Based on the finding that officers took an average of 200 milliseconds longer to shoot armed black suspects than armed white suspects, James et al. coined the reverse racism effect. Earlier, earlier iterations of this same study with the same authors and methodology frame the findings as the counter bias effect. So in sum, criminologists are misusing implicit bias as a proxy for talking about racism and abusing the derivative notion of counter bias to dismiss the disproportionate police use of lethal force against people of color. And this brings me to our third and final finding, methodological problems, which we see play out in three ways. Beginning with our first finding, the uncritical emphasis on quantitative studies results in egregiously over causal conclusions. One such study considers the correlation between police use of lethal force and community level homicide rates. Despite the finding that police killing of unarmed victims actually increased, the authors concluded that, and I quote, police use of lethal force on average removed dangerous criminals from the street. This finding holds true for white and Hispanic people, but not for black people for whom the homicide rate increased rather than decreased in the two months following an instance of the police use of lethal force. So to continue with the overly quantitative issue, criminologists are fixated on disputes about chosen denominators. Numerous articles claim that police did not use any force in 99.9639% of police citizen contacts. Here, the denominator includes officer initiated stops and all calls for service, even those that police did not actually respond to. So the result is an artificially small number that renders the use of force insignificant in the grand scheme of police civilian interactions. The issue of chosen denominator similarly contributes to discrepancies over the racial disproportionality in the police use of force. A study that used data from the Washington Post database on fatal encounters concluded that race in particular is socially inflammatory, unqualified, and cannot be the full story. Their argument is that police do not use force disproportionately against black people if one considers the propensity of black people to be involved in criminal conduct. In effect, 21st century criminologists are inclined to delegitimize crowdsource databases as anecdotal insofar as they raise attention to the impact of police violence in minority communities. Secondly, and related to the first finding, overly quantitative tendencies are evident in criminologists overemphasizing the utility, accuracy, and reliability of police data. With respect to national police cause fatalities, criminologists in the early 2000s had no clear alternative to using the Supplementary Homicide Report, or SHR, that is published annually by the FBI. However, the SHR underestimates police killings. From 2013 to 2014, the SHR reported 267 Black victims, whereas the crowdsource database reported 419 Black victims. 
Notably, the undercount discrepancy was not as significant for white victims. Despite the availability of alternate databases, criminologists still prefer official data, even with the knowledge of its well-documented undercount. So a reliance on police data also engenders a reliance on incident reports and or civilian complaints. One article explored officer decisions to shoot versus not to shoot by comparing scenarios in which officers draw their weapon but do not fire them to instances where officers do fire their weapons. Drawing data from use of force reports, the study concluded that, and I quote, black suspects were not, black suspects were approximately one third as likely to be shot relative to other suspects even after they controlled for incident characteristics. In controlling for incident characteristics, the study created a high risk incident dummy variable for calls involving suspicious activity. This study fails to account for the fact that black people are often presumed to be engaged in suspicious activity when in fact such a designation is unwarranted. The study finds that officers were more likely to draw their weapons on black people yet less likely to shoot and therefore concludes that black suspects were not disproportionately the target of police shootings. An alternative way of interpreting this finding, which is not explored in the article, is that black people are more likely to have weapons drawn on them when there was no need for lethal force to be an option. So turning to the reliance on complaints, scholars maintain that they are central to policing. However, complaints are not a reliable proxy for police conduct because formal civilian complaints include only those grievances that are reported to the police by civilians. However, the potential for an undercount of complaints is overshadowed by an emphasis on the potential for an overcount. For example, complaints are derided as frivolous and complaints are also fr framed by criminologists as a positive indicator in that a high number of citizen complaints for specific officers may actually be an indicator of officer productivity. In some, criminologists emphasize the potential for an overcount despite evidence of an undercount, ultimately reinforcing the trope that the police use of force is rare. So finally, not only does criminology tend to be overly quantitative, but mainstream criminologists discredit participant observation studies as expensive, requiring permission, and limited to a subset of officers and jurisdictions. Out of the 121 total articles, only six utilize qualitative methodologies. So in conclusion, our sample allows us to identify the scope of inquiry for 21st century criminologists with respect to the police use of force. Inside, we see conversations about implicit bias to the exclusion of conversations about explicit racism. We see place and behavior-based variables wherein race is a Latin category, which forecloses a conversation about structural racism. We see police-based data as unequivocally legitimate while crowdsourced databases are discredited as anecdotal and civilian-based data is biased and unrepresentative. Finally, we see an emphasis on quantitative studies to the exclusion of qualitative studies that center and validate the lived experiences of Black Americans. Ultimately, what is beyond the scope of inquiry for 21st century criminologists are more, are more transformative solutions rooted in the Black feminist tradition of abolition. So these findings suggest that criminology has a race problem. It's largely a historical approach, it's troublesome theoretical framings and its methodological shortcomings have produced a literature that largely obscures the role of race and racism and how police use force. So to be clear, not all social scientists who work in criminology fit this mold. There are notable exceptions where some scholars have taken a much more thoughtful and robust approach to these issues. We are simply trying to identify trends within the data set that we examine from the top 10 criminology journals uh, and that there may be a more diverse set of research being made in other journals and outlets. Nevertheless, criminology as a field is in dire need of theoretical interventions to reorient its research so that it can capture how race and racism shape the entire criminological landscape, not just issues regarding police use of force. Our hope is that moving forward, a new generation of social scientists inter interested in criminological questions can embrace critical race theory as a way to think about this endeavor. 
there are interesting ways to do this, and we are happy to talk more about this during the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for uh, that uh, presentation. Um, in a way, it just reminds us of the different uh, ways in which uh, knowledge production uh, is a part of the problem. Uh, when you were speak speaking, Peyton, I was thinking particularly about uh, the point uh, you were making about a situational uh, factors and behavioral dynamics and how they play a role. And I was reminded of the extent to which in constitutional criminal procedure, for example, there's a term that gets circulated in case after case case of the case that's referred to high crime area. It's not explicitly racially encoded, but of course it is. Uh, and so it's legitimate to police or over police high crime area. So while there isn't an express articulation of let's go get black and brown people, uh, the fact that that um, uh, space can be a legitimate um, domain for law enforcement activity is doing just that. So the um, situational factors that you mentioned seems to me to be working in the same way that that particular um, uh, frame uh, works in the context of um, law. Uh, but let me try and uh, get each of you now to respond. I mean, people have been throwing a few questions out, uh, out at you and um, I'm hoping that you might uh, pick at them as you as you like. Uh, so I'll, I'll start uh, just with uh, uh, Kiara, uh, because I, I did want uh, you to speak to this uh, point I made about the death and uh, how it occupies both ends of the debate and what you might think about that, because I imagine that uh, death could figure in a way that leads to a particular articulation of public safety and a particular need for protection that could end up uh, driving a more aggressive law enforcement um, activities uh, to restrict um, women's uh, reproductive autonomy. So I'm hoping that you could speak to that. Um, then I'll turn to Sunita. A question was raised about uh, how we might broaden the public uh, safety um, net, particularly with respect to um, conversations about veteran by linking it to questions of empire and what it is that uh, the US military uh, does abroad uh, in, in, in the sense of creating enormous um, uh, problems of unsafety um, and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, terrains of supposed safety, that is to say hospitals. So there was a question that um, uh, got at that in, in a way that my uh, rearticulation doesn't quite capture, but I asked you to look at that question um, uh, as well. So, so we'll do that and then I'll invite um, uh, Jeff uh, and uh, Peyton and, and Osagi to weigh into questions as has there been posed. So let's start with Kiara. Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. And the reality is that death is deployed and specifically, um, uh, and death, then let me, let me finish my sentence. Death is deployed in the fight for abortion restrictions. Death has been deployed in the fight for um, criminalizing abortion, right? Returning abortion to the, the jurisdiction of police officers and prosecutors and correctional you know, facilities. That is that, I mean, I, I would want to underscore that that is what this whole fight over abortion rights is about, is about whether police and prosecutors and, and correctional, institution, uh, correctional institutions um, ha are, have jurisdiction, right, um, have standing to, to, to punish um, people who engage in um, terminating pregnancies. But death has been deployed um, in the fight for abortion restrictions um, because, you know, we always hear about fetal life and et cetera, et cetera. What I want to highlight here is that the death of Black fetuses has been deployed in the fight for abortion uh, restrictions. Um, and this is kind of new, right? I mentioned that the uh, black people turn to abortion care at two to three times the rate at which white people turn to abortion care. And uh, abortion anti-abortion activists have used those statistics um, is to uh, garner support for these so-called race selective abortion bans, right? And so the purpose of these bans is to prevent people from terminating a pregnancy when they're trying to, uh, when they're acting on the basis of race. And the idea here is that there's some sort of genocidal plot out there um, that black people are being targeted for abortion care. And so these race selective abortion bans are trying to save uh, black people from, you know, this genocidal plot from eugenicists, essentially, um, when in reality, 
Black people disproportionately rely on abortion care, not because there's some genocidal plot out there, but rather because of structural racism. And so, yeah. On this particular point, uh, is it the case that that um, campaign, the most dangerous womb campaign, do, do we yeah. still see that? Does that still circulate? That image is still circulating. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and it just got its most uh, vigorous um, and eloquent, even articulation in uh, Justice Thomas's concurrence in Box versus Planned Parenthood. I mean, he spent. 27 pages um, talking about the eugenics movement and how eugenics movement finds its life. You know, the current manifestation of the eugenics movement of the turn of the 20th century is in abortion rates, you know, among black people today. So that discourse isn't going anywhere. And I think it's important for those who are interested in reproductive justice. I think for those who are interested in racial justice to foreground that Black people disproportionately rely on abortion services because of structural racism, not because of nefarious bad actors, but rather this is just another site, you know, another site in which Black people's marginalization is demonstrated. So, Sunisha, I, 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 um, after you spoke, I, I said something about uh, the relationship to of your work to debates about pipelines versus web. So I know you didn't get much of a chance to explicate that, but I think it's important because it's part of um, the structural intervention that your work is making. So I'm asking a lot of you. I'm asking you to say a little bit about that, and I'm asking you to, to take on this question of empire, and I'm asking you to do all of that in a very short space of time. So one, two, three, yeah. go. I would say that my analysis that I try to explain a little bit more in the paper is that we can't think of um, the hospital policing circumstance as a pipeline. Instead, it's a structural problem. We need to take seriously this idea of carcerality wrapping, them, wrapping itself around um, people and the institutions completely. And so this, this relates to the work of Osagi on pre-hospital um, interventions with paramedics and police. It also relates to the work of Ji Sun Song, who's looking at emergency departments and the co-optation of um, emergency care workers in the utilization of the Fourth Amendment. And so I think there's this, this rich body of literature that's really looking at this structural relationship between healthcare, hospitals and, and, and street and hospital policing. Um, Jeff is also working on this in a new study. But, and then in terms of the in, empire question, no doubt that the, um, the extraction of labor of poor people by the military and the US government in, is implicated in this entire system. Why is it that the VA has created this, you know, potentially utopic world for veterans who have been harmed and injured um, during their military service. I mean, those are, it, veterans exceptionalism is a really important thing for us to think about. Why is this not accessible to everyone, um, et cetera. So I'll end there. So, so Jeff, I want to bring you back in. And a, a question was raised about whether we're talking about uh, uh, policing uh, a bit. Uh, we've not yet said that much about prosecutors, how we should be thinking about that. I don't know if I have a view about that. And I also wanted you to um, elaborate just a little bit on a point that you made about um, data uh, being mobilized in this context vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the kind of um, um, rising crime that's been articulated that's happening in this moment and that happened um, against the backdrop of um, uh, decreased police presence people are saying and how you think about that part of what you said I heard is that uh, one of the reason we might be seeing um, some of this uh, contesting first of all that uh, there's a linear story that one can tell but but that people's unwillingness to enlist the police in any kind of way is a partial explanation i just want to know whether there's more you might say uh to that or whether there's pushback against those statistics or or not um and any other dimension of the questions that you saw uh that you want to take on once again with great economy oh, okay well first for sunita and her work this is um it's terrific. My, my former student, um, who's now, a, a, I think, the chair of African American Studies at um, uh, University of Maryland, is Joe Richardson. And Joe's work on, he's, he did some ethnographic studies in the, during the Baltimore uprising in the hospital in Baltimore and showed through observation and interviews with the, with the uh, uh, nurses, the nursing staff, uh, that the police would enter into the emergency rooms and actually go up into the wards where people had been admitted and intimidate them, the nurses from recording the stuff that goes into standard public health reporting to the ICD codes um, from actually entering 
law enforcement participation or causation of the injury that got these kids admitted. Mostly young men, so I would use the term kid. Um, so Joe's work is something that would be really um, interesting to take a look at. Um, the, the question about um, prosecutors, you know, there's a wonderful op-ed in today's New York Times in the print edition, yesterday online, really taking to task the idea of progressive prosecutors, that they've essentially maintained the structural, the structural um, uh, components of prosecution. They've tinkered at the, at the, at the margins. Uh, they've, they've relaxed for some areas of crime, their prosecution. For other areas, they continue to be fairly aggressive. Um, you see it if you actually go into the weeds in prosecutors' offices and watch them do their day-to-day -day work. Uh, Issa Cole Hausman's book on this, on uh, misdemeanor enforcement in New York City, Misdemeanor Land was the title of the book, pretty much shows that really nothing has changed even in the face of progressive prosecutors. But she really gets at the point, um, not Issa, but um, uh, uh, the, the op-ed in the Times um, talks about, is a study done by a group of researchers in Philadelphia. They talk about how bail is set extraordinarily high as a way to kind of signal to the judges that trying to force them into um, releasing somebody on bail, but, in, but without bail. But it turns out that the judges say, okay, fine, we're gonna accept your bail recommendation. These are like million, million dollar bail recommendations. It's a really extraordinary study about the way they've done. And basically they show that very, very little has changed with respect to the referral to, to detention. Um, the last point is about this, this, this national panic, and it really is a moral panic about the shootings in, in, in cities across the country and, um, and homicides. Um, it neglects any of the relevant causal factors. And if you actually, just to put it really simply, and you can do a lot of this with a graph, there's a graph in the Council of Criminal Justice uh, report on the rise in homicides that shows that a lot of it is they want to blame this on, uh, on the police, on the, the criticism of the police that's driving them to abandon their posts, not to do enforcement and so on. Well, it turns out if you look at the, if you look at the curves, all of this happened long before, the, before George Floyd's killing in any of the street protests. The curve was going up. Why did it go up? Because as a pandemic, because people are out of work, people are desperate. Um, the police were reallocated their time and their space to their time and their efforts to policing protests, often brutally. Uh, there's been a number of investigations in different cities. Um, but the math, of, the math of it is really quite amazing how um, much in the way that, that uh, Osagi and, and Peyton talk about the, the kind of um, bias that they apply to the, um, uh, to the data, the bias is really, um, it's just very striking uh, about the unwillingness to take into account, um, say, for example, epidemic phenomena, contagion phenomena, other things that simply really explain that we've seen these peaks over and over again over time. Thank you. So I want to uh, go back to uh, uh, Peyton and Osagi in this regard. Um, so one of the so, so one uh, people are obviously hoping that uh, the paper is going to be available soon. So I'm just going to say yes, presumptively the paper is going to be available soon. So it will <laughs> for everyone to read and further engage. One of the things that um, I, I think is especially productive is that it provides a template that people can employ to um, uh, engage other sites of knowledge production and raise questions about the presence or absence of meaningful engagements with race. I think it's terrific in that regard. Um, on the other one, I wanna um, either of you, both of you uh, to ventriloquize if you could, what criminologists are going to say when they encounter this piece. So what pushback um, do you predict uh, you will get when this piece comes out? Is there some dimension along which you think you might be particularly vulnerable or not? So, so speak to what you think uh, will happen uh, when uh, your ideas end up being circulated. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Devin. That's an interesting question. Um, so the, the standpoint that this, uh, that motivates this, uh, this, this critique of criminality comes from the work that myself and you, David, and Kiara and Jeff and uh, folks on this panel have talked about in terms of in what it means to bring the critical race theory in conversation with social science methods. And so we were basically taking a critical race approach to understanding the field of criminology using a set of, uh, of social science methods in terms of taking a, uh, a, um, a sample of articles from criminology journals, reading them, coding them, and then understanding various trends that are happening in the field. But using that, but doing that, uh, going about this in a way that prioritizes critical race standpoints, that is understanding power dynamics, understanding the centrality of race, 
um, and other commitments that critical race theory has. So I, I, I preface this response by saying that I think uh, uh, my colleagues who consider themselves criminologists will probably think that that methodological approach is inappropriate for the study of, uh, for the social scientific study of, of crime and policing. Um, that is to say that they will probably see themselves as uh, neutral and, and objective social scientists who simply uh, read and assess data and report the findings. Uh, and the findings um, um, simply speak themselves. That is to say that there is no need for a theoretical orientation to read data. And that's where I think the kind of uh, uh, the, the difference between our uh, critique and uh, traditional criminological approach will be. That is to say that Peyton and I are, are, are trying to suggest that in order to properly situate the data, you need theoretical orientation to understand what exactly you're doing. That's kind of you know sociology 101. Sociology or any social science is not simply counting beings. It is having an appropriate theoretical and historical context from, from which to understand why the beings are important in the first place. Um, and so uh, I would imagine that would be the primary critique. Um, moreover, I think there are kind of certain um, prior commitments that many criminologists have. That is to uh, a prior commitment to de-emphasizing race and racism um, and to um, prioritize and indeed defer to the interests of police. And there's a long conversation about how and why that occurs, including the fact that many criminologists receive their funding from police departments themselves and other forms of uh, other parts of the criminal justice system. Um, so this idea that they are objective and dispassionate is belied by the very fact that they get their money from the very people that they're reporting on. That is a separate conversation that we can have. Um, uh, but I think um, these type of, uh, these would be, I think the, the the first of many pushbacks that they would offer. Uh, Peyton, did you want to add anything? Peyton, I think you're on mute. She's muted. Hayden, can we get you unmuted? Maybe the organizers can help. Okay. So, so can I can I comment briefly as a as an elected fellow of the American Society of Criminology? <laughs> yes, uh, very briefly. Very briefly. Um, I think that there is a both an ideological and a publication bias at play. Um, there are lots of people in criminology who take um, critical perspectives, whether they're critical race perspectives, critical legal perspectives. Um, so there's a few things to say. One, a lot of the stuff that, that you pointed out to is, is just simply lousy work. Um, <laughs> two, um, I, there, it, it's interesting that outside of criminology, all of the critiques although not necessarily from a, a critical, critical perspective, are on the table. And so there's this tension between, for example, especially economists. Now we all have some reservations about economists in different ways, but the economists are the ones who gang up on, on actually the same people who are publishing the work that you and Peyton are, are um, uh, that Asagi and Peyton are, are, are criticizing. But the critiques don't get into criminology. There's willful blindside and willful racial blindside at play. For some of the reasons that Osagi points out, the, the, the other one is that they're dependent, their careers depend on getting access to data from police departments. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get it, they're out of business and their tenures are denied. So there's just a, really a certain amount of self-reinforcement. Just one last thing, when, um, uh, when Roland Flyer, Fryer published this paper saying there's no bias in police stops and police shootings. Um, and it was cited in the Wall Street Journal and a lot of conservatives picked up on it. Um, uh, over 2000 people, signed a letter to the Wall Street Journal and to Fryer saying, you need to retract this. This is really bad research. So there is a pushback. It's there quite, but it's, it's just simply, you know, there's almost a threshold effect where they have to kind of uh, push a little harder to get it into play. Right. All right. I, I just want to, I want to, I'm sorry. So, so I, I apologize for having to um, 
uh, end uh, the session at this particular moment. Um, it, it, we are uh, running a little short on, 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 on time, and so we need to carry on. What I want to say is that um, this has been incredibly, incredibly uh, generative, and the works that will come out of this in the publication will help uh, to stage other kinds of conversations because this is certainly um, unfinished business. I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to be on this panel for um, indulging the rapid fire way in which I forced you to respond uh, with far too much economy than was really justified, but, but thank you for um, indulging it. Uh, what I want to do now is uh, pivot uh, to our uh, Dean who is here uh, to offer uh, a quick welcome. And uh, again, we've said uh, throughout the day that we're not really doing um, introductions. I'll simply say that Jennifer Manukin has been Dean at the law school for a little over five years. Um, she uh, works in the area of um, evidence and forensic science and in that context has uh, spent some time pushing back against the ways in which um, uh, forensic science gets mobilized as uncontestable truth and um, uh, has uh, recently been elected to the American Academy of um, Arts and Sciences based uh, in part on uh, the terrific work that she's done in this space. So uh, let me shut up and simply again, uh, invite uh, Jennifer Manukin to uh, say hello. Thanks so much, Devin and everybody. Really, I just wanted to come and welcome all of you um, to this tremendous symposium and to say, uh, how glad I am that we're able to host this and that we have such a terrific set of, of panelists. Um, and thank you also to all of you who are who are listening in. Um, I, I'm just delighted to welcome you to, to, to the symposium. I also want to especially thank the organizers, both Professors Patel and Crenshaw, but also the students, um, Ryan Garcia and A.K. Shi and all of the other students who helped to make this a reality. Um, it's really terrific to see such an exciting program being put on on such an important um, topic. Uh, you know, this is certainly, and we've heard the word unprecedented too often, but this is certainly a, a deeply uh, challenging and, and problematic time in our nation's history. And uh, the events of week, recent weeks and months uh, starkly show the ongoing threat of structural forms of bigotry and discrimination and the dangers that they pose in very much ongoing ways uh, to our nation, to our democracy, and to the, the people, the bodies inside of our, our communities. Um, and as such, I just can't imagine a topic for this year's symposium that could be more timely or, or more important. Um, and so, so thank you for being part of it. I now have the honor of very quickly introducing the speaker who will make some closing remarks today. Um, and this is really a speaker who needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, she's one of our nation's foremost legal scholars and we're very proud that she spends part of her time uh, here with us at UCLA Law School. Uh, she is the most cited woman uh, in the legal scholarship uh, uh, period. And in 2019, Prospect Magazine named her as one of the 10 most important thinkers in the world. Uh, she's popularly known for uh, developing the term intersectionality. Um, and she's also a foundational creator of critical race theory. Um, and we're of course very proud at UCLA Law School um, to have our critical race theory program here. She's been a pioneering scholar in the areas of civil rights, uh, Black feminist legal theory, and race, racism, and the law. And she is a distinguished professor and shared professor, uh, in fact, the, a promised professor uh, here at the UCLA Law School. She's also the executive director of the African American Policy Forum and does also spend time at the Columbia Law School, too. Um, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce you to someone who literally needs no introduction, uh, Kim Crenshaw, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Manukin. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, your kind introduction. Um, I just basically want to do some thank yous uh, in a little summing up. Thank you to the UCLA Law Review for their tireless work in ensuring that this important uh, symposium transpired. There, of course, were reasons not to try to do a symposium, but the reasons that it was absolutely essential that it happened and that it happened on this topic uh, were obviously um, overwhelming. And, and thank you so much for um, uh, making this happen. I also want to thank my good friend, uh, Sunita Patel, who was the force, the vision, um, and the energy uh, behind 
uh, this framework and this stellar lineup of thinkers. Um, and I wanna thank all of the panelists and colleagues, those who joined us today for this critical conversation and those who are going to join us tomorrow uh, as well. Um, to help close, I, I wanna lift up something from the literary titan, James Baldwin, who once remarked, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. History is present in all that we do. Um, and that couldn't be more true than as it relates to the issues that we've been discussing um, today and that we will continue to discuss tomorrow. I started this morning by interrogating the siege at the Capitol and it was an attempt to um, uh, think about how the effort to overthrow the election uh, was an embodiment of lawlessness that as one of the panelists this morning said, created somewhat of a cognitive dissonance. We saw it um, in the police officers that didn't really know what to do and the commentators who didn't really know what to say and pundits and, and frankly, um, those who want to reintegrate uh, that moment of, of fissure, the fracture into uh, a story of American exceptionalism. Um, this this, this uh, moment is one in which the rehearsal of law enforcement as a system of racial control and racial entitlement um, was put in sharp relief, particularly against the backdrop of how Black Lives Matter um, has been policed over the over its lifetime. Um, at the same time, what's also been uh, put into sharp relief is another dimension of the racial contours of ideological investments in knowledge and free speech conflicts that are now at a crossroads. Um, efforts to suppress and, and sanction knowledge, uh, the knowledge that we have been exploring here today, um, where for a short time, uh, at the end of the Trump administration features a federal policy. Um, that federal policy, the executive order still has consequences. The chilling effects are still being widely felt today. And despite the withdrawal of that order, we recognize that in fact, um, a new front line in policing has opened up. So not only are subjects to which CRT attends continuously subject to policing and a wider regime of carceral strategies. Now CRT itself is subject to surveillance, discipline, intervention, and potentially uh, termination. So today's conversation shows us in grave and great detail exactly what is at stake how the production of racist knowledge has facilitated and structured racial power and how efforts to contest that racial power begin with naming and denaturalizing it. How, how these projects, these knowledge producing uh, endeavors are essential to grounding, extending and mobilizing the energies that were unleashed this year in the midst of these dual pandemics. From the underlying logics in which law has authorized policing practices in the creation and insulation of the status quo, to the continuous reach and extension to spaces and issues traditionally seen as falling outside of the realm of policing. We've heard in this panel about hospitals and schools and more broadly reproductive freedom. The urgency and the need for critical frames is dramatically and urgently on display in this conversation. Addressing fully then the implications of law in the structural dimensions of racial injustice takes us beyond mere diversity demands to interrogate the very conventions and foundational innovations of our profession. It takes us into the vital conversations that we've had today. So the promise of equality is a promise that we critically engage what is taken for granted in our social order and requires that we disrupt institutional settlement on the practices and the stories that our society tells itself to justify the status quo. It isn't surprising then why CRT is at the crosshairs of those who wanna storm the democracy 
in order to reestablish a baseline that regards our work as un-American as deeply threatening, or in the words of the Southern Baptist Convention, ungodly. What is surprising is the relative silence of colleagues, thinkers, even activists in the face of efforts to censor the critical knowledge produced within and by critical race theory. So in a time of such precarity for these ideas as we've discussed today, it's imperative that we fight back against those who stand against the path of racial justice. However contested these ideas are, we should heed the words of our UC law deans who said that ideas like critical race theory and intersectionality are quote, are not in the least anti-American propaganda, but rather are quite necessary to our hopes for an America that will someday live up to its promise of equality for all, end quote. So I cannot thank everybody enough who was involved in this symposium for all of their work. Tomorrow, the symposium will continue at 1015 AM with panels on social movements, institutional change, and freedom dreams. We look forward to seeing you all there. You don't want to miss it. Enjoy your afternoon.